Middle March by George Eliot. Book 6. The Widow and the Wife. Chapter 54. Negli Achi Porta la Mia Donna Amore, per che sifa gente cio cella mira, oviela passa, agni uom ver le si gira, e cui saluta fa tremar lo cor. Sitch, basando il viso, tutto smore, e diagni sua defeto aller suspira, fugan dinanzi a le superbia ed ira, aiutatimi, don, a faral honor. Agni dulcetza, Agni pensiero umile nas nel cor a chi parlar la sente, andi beato chi prima la vide. Quel cella par quand un poco soride, non si puo dicer, na tenera ment, si a nuovo miracolo gentile. Dante, la vita nuova. By that delightful morning when the hayricks at Stone Court were scenting the air quite impartially, as if Mr. Raffles had been a guest worthy of finest incense, Dorothea had again taken up her abode at Lowick Manor. After three months freshet had become rather oppressive, to sit like a model for St. Catherine looking rapturously at Celia's baby would not do for many hours in the day, and to remain in that momentous babe's presence with persistent disregard was a course that could not have been tolerated in a childless sister. Dorothea would have been capable of carrying baby joyfully for a mile if there had been need, and of loving it the more tenderly for that labor, but to an aunt who does not recognize her infant nephew as Buddha, and has nothing to do for him but to admire, his behavior is apt to appear monotonous, and the interest of watching him exhaustible. This possibility was quite hidden from Celia, who felt that Dorothea's childless widowhood fell in quite prettily with the birth of little Arthur, baby was named after Mr. Brook. Dodo is just the creature not to mind about having anything of her own, children or anything, said Celia to her husband. And if she had had a baby, it never could have been such a dear as Arthur. Could it, James? Not if it had been like Kasabin, said Sir James, conscious of some indirectness in his answer, and of holding a strictly private opinion as to the perfections of his firstborn. No. Just imagine. Really it was a mercy, said Celia, and I think it is very nice for Dodo to be a widow. She can be just as fond of our baby as if it were her own, and she can have as many notions of her own as she likes. It is a pity she was not a queen, said the devout Sir James. But what should we have been then? We must have been something else, said Celia, objecting to so laborious a flight of imagination. I like her better as she is. Hence, when she found that Dorothea was making arrangements for her final departure to Lowick, Celia raised her eyebrows with disappointment, and in her quiet unemphatic way shot a needle arrow of sarcasm. What will you do at Lowick, Dodo? You say yourself there is nothing to be done there, everybody is so clean and well off, it makes you quite melancholy. And here you have been so happy going all about Tipton with Mr. Garth into the worst backyards. And now uncle is abroad, you and Mr. Garth can have it all your own way, and I am sure James does everything you tell him. I shall often come here, and I shall see how baby grows all the better, said Dorothea. But you will never see him washed, said Celia, and that is quite the best part of the day. She was almost pouting, it did seem to her very hard in Dodo to go away from the baby when she might stay. Dear Kitty, I will come and stay all night on purpose, said Dorothea, but I want to be alone now, and in my own home. I wish to know the Fairbrothers better, and to talk to Mr. Fairbrother about what there is to be done in Middlemarch. Dorothea's native strength of will was no longer all converted into resolute submission. She had a great yearning to be at Lowick, and was simply determined to go, not feeling bound to tell all her reasons. But every one around her disapproved. Sir James was much pained, and offered that they should all migrate to Cheltenham for a few months with the sacred ark, otherwise called a cradle, at that period a man could hardly know what to propose if Cheltenham were rejected. The dowager Lady Chet Tam, just returned from a visit to her daughter in town, wished, at least, that Mrs. Vigo should be written to, and invited to accept the office of companion to Mrs. Casaubon it was not credible that Dorothea as a young widow would think of living alone in the house at Lowick. 
Mrs. Vigo had been reader and secretary to royal personages, and in point of knowledge and sentiments even Dorothea could have nothing to object to her. Mrs. Cadwallader said, privately, you will certainly go mad in that house alone, my dear. You will see visions. We have all got to exert ourselves a little to keep sane, and call things by the same names as other people call them by. To be sure, for younger sons and women who have no money, it is a sort of provision to go mad, they are taken care of then. But you must not run into that. I dare say you are a little bored here with our good dowager, but think what a bore you might become yourself to your fellow creatures if you were always playing tragedy queen and taking things sublimely. Sitting alone in that library at Lawick you may fancy yourself ruling the weather, you must get a few people round you who wouldn't believe you if you told them. That is a good lowering medicine. I never called everything by the same name that all the people about me did, said Dorothea, stoutly. But I suppose you have found out your mistake, my dear, said Mrs. Cadwallader, and that is a proof of sanity. Dorothea was aware of the sting, but it did not hurt her. No, she said, I still think that the greater part of the world is mistaken about many things. Surely one may be sane and yet think so, since the greater part of the world has often had to come round from its opinion. Mrs. Cadwallader said no more on that point to Dorothea, but to her husband she remarked, it will be well for her to marry again as soon as it is proper, if one could get her among the right people. Of course the Chethams would not wish it. But I see clearly a husband is the best thing to keep her in order. If we were not so poor I would invite Lord Triton. He will be Marquis some day, and there is no denying that she would make a good Marchioness, she looks handsomer than ever in her mourning. My dear Eleanor, do let the poor woman alone. Such contrivances are of no use, said the easy rector. No use? How are matches made, except by bringing men and women together? And it is a shame that her uncle should have run away and shut up the Grange just now. There ought to be plenty of eligible matches invited to Freshet and the Grange. Lord Triton is precisely the man, full of plans for making the people happy in a soft-headed sort of way. That would just suit Mrs. Kasabin. Let Mrs. Kasabin choose for herself, Eleanor. That is the nonsense you wise men talk. How can she choose if she has no variety to choose from? A woman's choice usually means taking the only man she can get. Mark my words, Humphrey. If her friends don't exert themselves, there will be a worse business than the Kasabin business yet. For heaven's sake don't touch on that topic, Eleanor. It is a very sore point with Sir James. He would be deeply offended if you entered on it to him unnecessarily. I have never entered on it, said Mrs. Cadwallader, opening her hands. Celia told me all about the will at the beginning, without any asking of mine. Yes, yes, but they want the thing hushed up, and I understand that the young fellow is going out of the neighborhood. Mrs. Cadwallader said nothing, but gave her husband three significant nods, with a very sarcastic expression in her dark eyes. Dorothea quietly persisted in spite of remonstrance and persuasion. So by the end of June the shutters were all opened at Lowick Manor, and the morning gazed calmly into the library, shining on the rows of notebooks as it shines on the weary waste planted with huge stones, the mute memorial of a forgotten faith, and the evening laden with roses entered silently into the blue-green boudoir where Dorothea chose oftenest to sit. At first she walked into every room, questioning the eighteen months of her married life, and carrying on her thoughts as if they were a speech to be heard by her husband. Then, she lingered in the library and could not be at rest till she had carefully ranged all the notebooks as she imagined that he would wish to see them, in orderly sequence. The pity which had been the restraining compelling motive in her life with him still clung about his image, even while she remonstrated with him in indignant thought and told him that he was unjust. One little act of hers may perhaps be smiled at as superstitious. The synoptical tabulation for the use of Mrs. Kasabin, she carefully enclosed and sealed, writing within the envelope, I could not use it. 
Do you not see now that I could not submit my soul to yours, by working hopelessly at what I have no belief in, Dorothea? Then she deposited the paper in her own desk. That silent colloquy was perhaps only the more earnest because underneath and through it all there was always the deep longing which had really determined her to come to Lawick. The longing was to see Will Ladislaw. She did not know any good that could come of their meeting, she was helpless, her hands had been tied from making up to him for any unfairness in his lot. But her soul thirsted to see him. How could it be otherwise? If a princess in the days of enchantment had seen a four-footed creature from among those which live in herds come to her once and again with a human gaze which rested upon her with choice and beseeching, what would she think of in her journeying, what would she look for when the herds passed her? Surely for the gaze which had found her, and which she would know again. Life would be no better than candlelight tinsel and daylight rubbish if our spirits were not touched by what has been, to issues of longing and constancy. It was true that Dorothea wanted to know the fair brothers better, and especially to talk to the new rector, but also true that remembering what Lydgate had told her about Will Ladislaw and little Miss Noble, she counted on Will's coming to Lowick to see the fair brother family. The very first Sunday, before she entered the church, she saw him as she had seen him the last time she was there, alone in the clergyman's pew, but when she entered his figure was gone. In the weekdays when she went to see the ladies at the rectory, she listened in vain for some word that they might let fall about Will, but it seemed to her that Mrs. Fairbrother talked of everyone else in the neighborhood and out of it. Probably some of Mr. Fairbrother's Middlemarch hearers may follow him to Lowick sometimes. Do you not think so? said Dorothea, rather despising herself for having a secret motive in asking the question. If they are wise they will, Mrs. Kasabin, said the old lady. I see that you set a right value on my son's preaching. His grandfather on my side was an excellent clergyman, but his father was in the law, most exemplary and honest nevertheless, which is a reason for our never being rich. They say fortune is a woman and capricious. But sometimes she is a good woman and gives to those who merit, which has been the case with you, Mrs. Kasabin, who have given a living to my son. Mrs. Fairbrother recurred to her knitting with a dignified satisfaction in her neat little effort at oratory, but this was not what Dorothea wanted to hear. Poor thing! She did not even know whether Will Ladislaw was still at Middlemarch, and there was no one whom she dared to ask, unless it were Lydgate. But just now she could not see Lydgate without sending for him or going to seek him. Perhaps Will Ladislaw having heard of that strange ban against him left by Mr. Kasabin, had felt it better that he and she should not meet again, and perhaps she was wrong to wish for a meeting that others might find many good reasons against. Still, I do wish it, came at the end of those wise reflections as naturally as a sob after holding the breath. And the meeting did happen, but in a formal way quite unexpected by her. One morning, about eleven, Dorothea was seated in her boudoir with a map of the land attached to the manor and other papers before her, which were to help her in making an exact statement for herself of her income and affairs. She had not yet applied herself to her work, but was seated with her hands folded on her lap, looking out along the avenue of limes to the distant fields. Every leaf was at rest in the sunshine, the familiar scene was changeless, and seemed to represent the prospect of her life full of motiveless ease, motiveless, if her own energy could not seek out reasons for ardent action. The widow's cap of those times made an oval frame for the face, and had a crown standing up, the dress was an experiment in the utmost laying on of crepe, but this heavy solemnity of clothing made her face look all the younger, with its recovered bloom, and the sweet, inquiring candor of her eyes. Her reverie was broken by tan trip, who came to say that Mr. Ladislaw was below, and begged permission to see Madam if it were not too early. I will see him, said Dorothea, rising immediately. Let him be shown into the drawing room. The drawing room was the most neutral room in the house to her, the one least associated with the trials of her married life, the damask matched the woodwork, which was all white and gold, there were two tall mirrors and tables with nothing on them, in brief, it was a room where you had no reason for sitting in one place rather than in another. It was below the boudoir, 
and had also a bow window looking out on the avenue. But when Pratt showed Will Ladislaw into it the window was open, and a winged visitor, buzzing in and out now and then without minding the furniture, made the room look less formal and uninhabited. Glad to see you here again, sir, said Pratt, lingering to adjust a blind. I am only come to say goodbye, Pratt, said Will, who wished even the butler to know that he was too proud to hang about Mrs. Kasabin now she was a rich widow. Very sorry to hear it, sir, said Pratt, retiring. Of course, as a servant who was to be told nothing, he knew the fact of which Ladislaw was still ignorant, and had drawn his inferences, indeed, had not differed from his betrothed tantrip when she said, your master was as jealous as a fiend, and no reason. Madam would look higher than Mr. Ladislaw, else I don't know her. Mrs. Cadwallader's maid says there's a lord coming who is to marry her when the morning's over. There were not many moments for Will to walk about with his hat in his hand before Dorothea entered. The meeting was very different from that first meeting in Rome when Will had been embarrassed and Dorothea calm. This time he felt miserable but determined, while she was in a state of agitation which could not be hidden. Just outside the door she had felt that this long for meeting was after all too difficult, and when she saw Will advancing towards her, the deep blush which was rare in her came with painful suddenness. Neither of them knew how it was, but neither of them spoke. She gave her hand for a moment, and then they went to sit down near the window, she on one settee and he on another opposite. Will was peculiarly uneasy, it seemed to him not like Dorothea that the mere fact of her being a widow should cause such a change in her manner of receiving him, and he knew of no other condition which could have affected their previous relation to each other, except that, as his imagination at once told him, her friends might have been poisoning her mind with their suspicions of him. I hope I have not presumed too much in calling, said Will, I could not bear to leave the neighborhood and begin a new life without seeing you to say goodbye. Presumed? Surely not. I should have thought it unkind if you had not wished to see me, said Dorothea, her habit of speaking with perfect genuineness asserting itself through all her uncertainty and agitation. Are you going away immediately? Very soon, I think. I intend to go to town and eat my dinners as a barrister, since, they say, that is the preparation for all public business. There will be a great deal of political work to be done by and by, and I mean to try and do some of it. Other men have managed to win an honorable position for themselves without family or money. And that will make it all the more honorable, said Dorothea, ardently. Besides, you have so many talents. I have heard from my uncle how well you speak in public, so that everyone is sorry when you leave off, and how clearly you can explain things. And you care that justice should be done to everyone. I am so glad. When we were in Rome, I thought you only cared for poetry and art, and the things that adorn life for us who are well off. But now I know you think about the rest of the world. While she was speaking Dorothea had lost her personal embarrassment, and had become like her former self. She looked at Will with a direct glance, full of delighted confidence. You approve of my going away for years, then, and never coming here again till I have made myself of some mark in the world, said Will, trying hard to reconcile the utmost pride with the utmost effort to get an expression of strong feeling from Dorothea. She was not aware how long it was before she answered. She had turned her head and was looking out of the window on the rose bushes, which seemed to have in them the summers of all the years when Will would be away. This was not judicious behavior. But Dorothea never thought of studying her manners, she thought only of bowing to a sad necessity which divided her from Will. Those first words of his about his intentions had seemed to make everything clear to her, he knew, she supposed, all about Mr. Kasabin's final conduct in relation to him, and it had come to him with the same sort of shock as to herself. He had never felt more than friendship for her, had never had anything in his mind to justify what she felt to be her husband's outrage on the feelings of both, and that friendship he still felt. Something which may be called an inward silent sob had gone on in Dorothea before she said with a pure voice, just trembling in the last words as if only from its liquid flexibility, yes, 
it must be right for you to do as you say. I shall be very happy when I hear that you have made your value felt. But you must have patience. It will perhaps be a long while. Will never quite knew how it was that he saved himself from falling down at her feet, when the long while came forth with its gentle tremor. He used to say that the horrible hue and surface of her crepe dress was most likely the sufficient controlling force. He sat still, however, and only said, I shall never hear from you. And you will forget all about me. No, said Dorothea, I shall never forget you. I have never forgotten anyone whom I once knew. My life has never been crowded, and seems not likely to be so. And I have a great deal of space for memory at Lawick, haven't I? She smiled. Good God! Will burst out passionately, rising, with his hat still in his hand, and walking away to a marble table, where he suddenly turned and leaned his back against it. The blood had mounted to his face and neck, and he looked almost angry. It had seemed to him as if they were like two creatures slowly turning to marble in each other's presence, while their hearts were conscious and their eyes were yearning. But there was no help for it. It should never be true of him that in this meeting to which he had come with bitter resolution he had ended by a confession which might be interpreted into asking for her fortune. Moreover, it was actually true that he was fearful of the effect which such confessions might have on Dorothea herself. She looked at him from that distance in some trouble, imagining that there might have been an offense in her words. But all the while there was a current of thought in her about his probable want of money, and the impossibility of her helping him. If her uncle had been at home, something might have been done through him. It was this preoccupation with the hardship of Will's wanting money, while she had what ought to have been his share, which led her to say, seeing that he remained silent and looked away from her, I wonder whether you would like to have that miniature which hangs upstairs, I mean that beautiful miniature of your grandmother. I think it is not right for me to keep it, if you would wish to have it. It is wonderfully like you. You are very good, said Will, irritably. No, I don't mind about it. It is not very consoling to have one's own likeness. It would be more consoling if others wanted to have it. I thought you would like to cherish her memory, I thought, Dorothea broke off an instant, her imagination suddenly warning her away from Aunt Julia's history, you would surely like to have the miniature as a family memorial. Why should I have that? when I have nothing else. A man with only a portmanteau for his stowage must keep his memorials in his head. Will spoke at random, he was merely venting his petulance, it was a little too exasperating to have his grandmother's portrait offered him at that moment. But to Dorothea's feeling his words had a peculiar sting. She rose and said with a touch of indignation as well as hauteur, you are much the happier of us too, Mr. Ladislaw, to have nothing. Will was startled. Whatever the words might be, the tone seemed like a dismissal, and quitting his leaning posture, he walked a little way towards her. Their eyes met, but with a strange questioning gravity. Something was keeping their minds aloof, and each was left to conjecture what was in the other. Will had really never thought of himself as having a claim of inheritance on the property which was held by Dorothea, and would have required a narrative to make him understand her present feeling. I never felt it a misfortune to have nothing till now, he said. But poverty may be as bad as leprosy, if it divides us from what we most care for. The words cut Dorothea to the heart, and made her relent. She answered in a tone of sad fellowship. Sorrow comes in so many ways. Two years ago I had no notion of that, I mean of the unexpected way in which trouble comes, and ties our hands, and makes us silent when we long to speak. I used to despise women a little for not shaping their lives more, and doing better things. I was very fond of doing as I liked, but I have almost given it up," she ended, smiling playfully. I have not given up doing as I like, but I can very seldom do it," said Will. He was standing two yards from her with his mind full of contradictory desires and resolves, desiring some unmistakable proof that she loved him, and yet dreading the position into which such a proof might bring him. 
the thing one most longs for may be surrounded with conditions that would be intolerable. At this moment Pratt entered and said, Sir James Chetam is in the library, madam. Ask Sir James to come in here, said Dorothea, immediately. It was as if the same electric shock had passed through her and Will. Each of them felt proudly resistant, and neither looked at the other, while they awaited Sir James's entrance. After shaking hands with Dorothea, he bowed as slightly as possible to Ladislaw, who repaid the slightness exactly, and then going towards Dorothea, said, I must say goodbye, Mrs. Kasabin, and probably for a long while. Dorothea put out her hand and said her goodbye cordially. The sense that Sir James was depreciating Will, and behaving rudely to him, roused her resolution and dignity, there was no touch of confusion in her manner. And when Will had left the room, she looked with such calm self-possession at Sir James, saying, How is Celia, that he was obliged to behave as if nothing had annoyed him? And what would be the use of behaving otherwise? Indeed, Sir James shrank with so much dislike from the association even in thought of Dorothea with Ladislaw as her possible lover, that he would himself have wished to avoid an outward show of displeasure which would have recognized the disagreeable possibility. If anyone had asked him why he shrank in that way, I am not sure that he would at first have said anything fuller or more precise than, that Ladislaw. Though on reflection he might have urged that Mr. Kasabin's codicil, barring Dorothea's marriage with Will, except under a penalty, was enough to cast unfitness over any relation at all between them. His aversion was all the stronger because he felt himself unable to interfere. But Sir James was a power in a way unguessed by himself. Entering at that moment, he was an incorporation of the strongest reasons through which Will's pride became a repellent force, keeping him asunder from Dorothea. Chapter 55 Hath she her faults? I would you had them too. They are the fruity must of soundest wine, or say, they are regenerating fire such as hath turned the dense black element into a crystal pathway for the sun. If youth is the season of hope, it is often so only in the sense that our elders are hopeful about us, for no age is so apt as youth to think its emotions, partings, and resolves are the last of their kind. Each crisis seems final, simply because it is new. We are told that the oldest inhabitants in Peru do not cease to be agitated by the earthquakes, but they probably see beyond each shock, and reflect that there are plenty more to come. To Dorothea, still in that time of youth when the eyes with their long full lashes look out after their rain of tears unsoiled and unwearied as a freshly opened passion flower, that morning's parting with Will Ladislaw seemed to be the close of their personal relations. He was going away into the distance of unknown years, and if ever he came back he would be another man. The actual state of his mind, his proud resolve to give the lie beforehand to any suspicion that he would play the needy adventurer seeking a rich woman, lay quite out of her imagination, and she had interpreted all his behavior easily enough by her supposition that Mr. Kasabin's codicil seemed to him, as it did to her, a gross and cruel interdict on any active friendship between them. Their young delight in speaking to each other, and saying what no one else would care to hear, was forever ended, and become a treasure of the past. For this very reason she dwelt on it without inward check. That unique happiness too was dead, and in its shadowed silent chamber she might vent the passionate grief which she herself wondered at. For the first time she took down the miniature from the wall and kept it before her, liking to blend the woman who had been too hardly judged with the grandson whom her own heart and judgment defended. Can anyone who has rejoiced in woman's tenderness think it a reproach to her that she took the little oval picture in her palm and made a bed for it there, and leaned her cheek upon it, as if that would soothe the creatures who had suffered unjust condemnation? She did not know then that it was love who had come to her briefly, as in a dream before awaking, with the hues of morning on his wings, that it was love to whom she was sobbing her farewell as his image was banished by the blameless rigor of irresistible day. She only felt that there was something irrevocably amiss and lost in her lot, and her thoughts about the future were the more readily Chopin into resolve. Ardent souls, ready to construct their coming lives, are apt to commit themselves to the fulfillment of their own visions.
One day that she went to Freshet to fulfill her promise of staying all night and seeing baby washed, Mrs. Cadwallader came to dine, the rector being gone on a fishing excursion. It was a warm evening, and even in the delightful drawing room, where the fine old turf sloped from the open window towards a lilied pool and well-planted mounds, the heat was enough to make Celia in her white muslin and light curls reflect with pity on what Dodo must feel in her black dress and close cap. But this was not until some episodes with Baby were over, and had left her mind at leisure. She had seated herself and taken up a fan for some time before she said, in her quiet guttural, Dear Dodo, do throw off that cap. I am sure your dress must make you feel ill. I am so used to the cap, it has become a sort of shell, said Dorothea, smiling. I feel rather bare and exposed when it is off. I must see you without it, it makes us all warm, said Celia, throwing down her fan, and going to Dorothea. It was a pretty picture to see this little lady in white muslin unfastening the widow's cap from her more majestic sister, and tossing it on to a chair. Just as the coils and braids of dark brown hair had been set free, Sir James entered the room. He looked at the released head, and said, Ah, in a tone of satisfaction. It was I who did it, James, said Celia. Dodo need not make such a slavery of her mourning, she need not wear that cap any more among her friends. My dear Celia, said Lady Chetam, a widow must wear her mourning at least a year. Not if she marries again before the end of it, said Mrs. Cadwallader, who had some pleasure in startling her good friend the Dowager. Sir James was annoyed, and leaned forward to play with Celia's Maltese dog. That is very rare, I hope, said Lady Chetam, in a tone intended to guard against such events. No friend of ours ever committed herself in that way except Mrs. Beaver, and it was very painful to Lord Grinsell when she did so. Her first husband was objectionable, which made it the greater wonder. And severely she was punished for it. They said Captain Beaver dragged her about by the hair, and held up loaded pistols at her. Oh, if she took the wrong man, said Mrs. Cadwallader, who was in a decidedly wicked mood. Marriage is always bad then, first or second. Priority is a poor recommendation in a husband if he has got no other. I would rather have a good second husband than an indifferent first. My dear, your clever tongue runs away with you, said Lady Chet Tam. I am sure you would be the last woman to marry again prematurely, if our dear rector were taken away. Oh, I make no vows, it might be a necessary economy. It is lawful to marry again, I suppose, else we might as well be Hindus instead of Christians. Of course if a woman accepts the wrong man, she must take the consequences, and one who does it twice over deserves her fate. But if she can marry blood, beauty, and bravery, the sooner the better. I think the subject of our conversation is very ill-chosen, said Sir James, with a look of disgust. Suppose we change it. Not on my account, Sir James, said Dorothea, determined not to lose the opportunity of freeing herself from certain oblique references to excellent matches. If you are speaking on my behalf, I can assure you that no question can be more indifferent and impersonal to me than second marriage. It is no more to me than if you talked of women going fox hunting, whether it is admirable in them or not, I shall not follow them. Pray let Mrs. Cadwallader amuse herself on that subject as much as on any other. My dear Mrs. Kasabin, said Lady Chet Tam, in her stateliest way, you do not, I hope, think there was any allusion to you in my mentioning Mrs. Beaver. It was only an instance that occurred to me. She was stepdaughter to Lord Grinsell, he married Mrs. Teveroy for his second wife. There could be no possible allusion to you. Oh no, said Celia. Nobody chose the subject, it all came out of Dodo's cap. Mrs. Cadwallader only said what was quite true. A woman could not be married in a widow's cap, James. Hush, my dear, said Mrs. Cadwallader. I will not offend again. I will not even refer to Dido or Zenobia. Only what are we to talk about? I, 
For my part, object to the discussion of human nature, because that is the nature of rector's wives. Later in the evening, after Mrs. Cadwallader was gone, Celia said privately to Dorothea, Really, Dodo, taking your cap off made you like yourself again in more ways than one. You spoke up just as you used to do, when anything was said to displease you. But I could hardly make out whether it was James that you thought wrong, or Mrs. Cadwallader. Neither, said Dorothea. James spoke out of delicacy to me, but he was mistaken in supposing that I minded what Mrs. Cadwallader said. I should only mind if there were a law obliging me to take any piece of blood and beauty that she or anybody else recommended. But you know, Dodo, if you ever did marry, it would be all the better to have blood and beauty, said Celia, reflecting that Mr. Kasabin had not been richly endowed with those gifts, and that it would be well to caution Dorothea in time. Don't be anxious, Kitty, I have quite other thoughts about my life. I shall never marry again, said Dorothea, touching her sister's chin, and looking at her with indulgent affection. Celia was nursing her baby, and Dorothea had come to say good night to her. Really, quite, said Celia. Not anybody at all, if he were very wonderful indeed. Dorothea shook her head slowly. Not anybody at all. I have delightful plans. I should like to take a great deal of land, and drain it, and make a little colony, where everybody should work, and all the work should be done well. I should know every one of the people and be their friend. I am going to have great consultations with Mr. Garth, he can tell me almost everything I want to know. Then you will be happy, if you have a plan, Dodo, said Celia. Perhaps little Arthur will like plans when he grows up, and then he can help you. Sir James was informed that same night that Dorothea was really quite set against marrying anybody at all, and was going to take to all sorts of plans, just like what she used to have. Sir James made no remark. To his secret feeling there was something repulsive in a woman's second marriage, and no match would prevent him from feeling it a sort of desecration for Dorothea. He was aware that the world would regard such a sentiment as preposterous, especially in relation to a woman of one and twenty, the practice of, the world being to treat of a young widow's second marriage as certain and probably near, and to smile with meaning if the widow acts accordingly. But if Dorothea did choose to espouse her solitude, he felt that the resolution would well become her. Chapter 56 How happy is he born and taught that serveth not another's will, whose armor is his honest thought, and simple truth his only skill. This man is freed from servile bands of hope to rise or fear to fall, lord of himself though not of lands, and having nothing yet hath all. Sir Henry Wotton Dorothea's confidence in Caleb Garth's knowledge, which had begun on her hearing that he approved of her cottages, had grown fast during her stay at Freshet, Sir James having induced her to take rides over the two estates in company with himself and Caleb, who quite returned her admiration, and told his wife that Mrs. Kasabin had a head for business most uncommon in a woman. It must be remembered that by business, Caleb never meant money transactions, but the skillful application of labor. Most uncommon, repeated Caleb. She said, that a thing I often used to think myself when I was a lad, Mr. Garth, I should like to feel, if I lived to be old, that I had improved a great piece of land and built a great many good cottages, because the work is of a healthy kind while it is being done, and after it is done, men are the better for it. Those were the very words, she sees into things in that way. But womanly, I hope, said Mrs. Garth, half suspecting that Mrs. Kasabin might not hold the true principle of subordination. Oh, you can't think, said Caleb, shaking his head. You would like to hear her speak, Susan. She speaks in such plain words, and a voice like music. Bless me. It reminds me of bits in the Messiah, and straightway there appeared a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, It has a tone with it that satisfies your ear. Caleb was very fond of music and when he could afford it went to hear an oratorio that came within his reach, returning from it with a profound reverence for this mighty structure of tones, which made him sit meditatively, looking on the floor and throwing much unutterable language into his outstretched hands.
With this good understanding between them, it was natural that Dorothea asked Mr. Garth to undertake any business connected with the three farms and the numerous tenements attached to Lowick Manor, indeed, his expectation of getting work for two was being fast fulfilled. As he said, business breeds. And one form of business which was beginning to breed just then was the construction of railways. A projected line was to run through Lowick Parish where the cattle had hitherto grazed in a piece unbroken by astonishment, and thus it happened that the infant struggles of the railway system entered into the affairs of Caleb Garth, and determined the course of this history with regard to two persons who were dear to him. The submarine railway may have its difficulties, but the bed of the sea is not divided among various landed proprietors with claims for damages not only measurable but sentimental. In the hundred to which Middlemarch belonged railways were as exciting a topic as the reform bill or the imminent horrors of cholera, and those who held the most decided views on the subject were women and landholders. Women both old and young regarded travelling by steam as presumptuous and dangerous, and argued against it by saying that nothing should induce them to get into a railway carriage, while proprietors, differing from each other in their arguments as much as Mr. Solomon Featherstone differed from Lord Medlicote, were yet unanimous in the opinion that in selling land, whether to the enemy of mankind or to a company obliged to purchase, these pernicious agencies must be made to pay a very high price. To landowners for permission to injure mankind. But the slower wits, such as Mr. Solomon and Mrs. Wall, who both occupied land of their own, took a long time to arrive at this conclusion, their minds halting at the vivid conception of what it would be to cut the big pasture in two, and turn it into three-cornered bits, which would be know-how, while accommodation bridges and high payments were remote and incredible. The cows will all cast their calves, brother, said Mrs. Wall, in a tone of deep melancholy, if the railway comes across the near close, and I shouldn't wonder at the mare too, if she was in full. It's a poor tale if a widow's property is to be spaded away, and the law say nothing to it. What's to hinder M from cutting right and left if they begin? It's well known, I can't fight. The best way would be to say nothing, and set somebody on to send M away with a flea in their ear, when they came spying and measuring, said Solomon. Folks did that about brassing, by what I can understand. It's all a pretense, if the truth was known, about their being forced to take one way. Let M go cutting in another parish. And I don't believe in any pay to make amends for bringing a lot of ruffians to trample your crops. Where's a company's pocket? Brother Peter, God forgive him, got money out of a company, said Mrs. Wall. But that was for the manganese. That wasn't for railways to blow you to pieces right and left. Well, there's this to be said, Jane, Mr. Solomon concluded, lowering his voice in a cautious manner, the more spokes we put in their wheel, the more they'll pay us to let M go on, if they must come whether or not. This reasoning of Mr. Solomon's was perhaps less thorough than he imagined, his cunning bearing about the same relation to the course of railways as the cunning of a diplomatist bears to the general chill or catarrh of the solar system. But he set about acting on his views in a thoroughly diplomatic manner, by stimulating suspicion. His side of Lowick was the most remote from the village, and the houses of the laboring people were either lone cottages or were collected in a hamlet called Frick, where a watermill and some stone pits made a little center of slow, heavy shouldered industry. In the absence of any precise idea as to what railways were, public opinion in Frick was against them for the human mind in that grassy corner had not the proverbial tendency to admire the unknown, holding rather that it was likely to be against the poor man, and that suspicion was the only wise attitude with regard to it. Even the rumor of reform had not yet excited any millennial expectations in Frick, there being no definite promise in it, as of gratuitous grains to fatten Hiram Ford's pig, or of a publican at the weights and scales, who would brew beer for nothing, or of an offer on the part of the three neighboring farmers to raise wages during winter. And without distinct good of this kind in its promises, reform seemed on a footing with the bragging of peddlers, which was a hint for distrust to every knowing person. The men of Frick were not ill-fed, and were less given to fanaticism than to a strong muscular suspicion, 
less inclined to believe that they were peculiarly cared for by heaven, than to regard heaven itself as rather disposed to take them in, a disposition observable in the weather. Thus the mind of Frick was exactly of the sort for Mr. Solomon Featherstone to work upon, he having more plenteous ideas of the same order, with a suspicion of heaven and earth which was better fed and more entirely at leisure. Solomon was overseer of the roads at that time, and on his slow-paced cob often took his rounds by Frick to look at the workmen getting the stones there, pausing with a mysterious deliberation, which might have misled you into supposing that he had some other reason for staying than the mere want of impulse to move. After looking for a long while at any work that was going on, he would raise his eyes a little and look at the horizon, finally he would shake his bridle, touch his horse with the whip, and get it to move slowly onward. The hour hand of a clock was quick by comparison with Mr. Solomon, who had an agreeable sense that he could afford to be slow. He was in the habit of pausing for a cautious, vaguely designing chat with every hedger or ditcher on his way, and was especially willing to listen even to news which he had heard before, feeling himself at an advantage over all narrators in partially disbelieving them. One day, however, he got into a dialogue with Hiram Ford, a wagoner, in which he himself contributed information. He wished to know whether Hiram had seen fellows with staves and instruments spying about, they called themselves railroad people, but there was no telling what they were or what they meant to do. The least they pretended was that they were going to cut Lowick Parish into sixes and sevens. Why? There'll be no stirring from one PLA ace to another, said Hiram, thinking of his wagon and horses. Not a bit, said Mr. Solomon. And cutting up fine land such as this parish. Let M go into Tipton, say I. But there's no knowing what there is at the bottom of it. Traffic is what they put for art, but it's to do harm to the land and the poor man in the long run. Why, they're Lunnon chaps, I reckon, said Hiram, who had a dim notion of London as a centre of hostility to the country. I, to be sure. And in some parts against Brassing, by what I've heard say, the folks fell on M when they were spying, and broke their peepholes as they carry, and drove M away, so as they knew better than come again. It wore good foon, I'd be bound, said Hiram, whose fun was much restricted by circumstances. Well, I wouldn't meddle with M myself, said Solomon. But some say this country seen its best days, and the sign is, as it's being overrun with these fellows trampling right and left, and wanting to cut it up into railways, and all for the big traffic to swallow up the little, so as there shan't be a team left on the land, nor a whip to crack. I'll crack my whip about their ear and, afore they bring it to that, though, said Hiram, while Mr. Solomon, shaking his bridle, moved onward. Nettle seed needs no digging. The ruin of this countryside by railroads was discussed, not only at the weights and scales, but in the hayfield, where the muster of working hands gave opportunities for talk such as were rarely had through the rural year. One morning, not long after that interview between Mr. Fairbrother and Mary Garth, in which she confessed to him her feeling for Fred Vincey, it happened that her father had some business which took him to Yodrell's farm in the direction of Frick, it was to measure and value an outlying piece of land belonging to Lowick Manor which Caleb expected to dispose of advantageously for Dorothea. It must be confessed that his bias was towards getting the best possible terms from railroad companies. He put up his gig at Yodrell's, and in walking with his assistant and measuring chain to the scene of his work, he encountered the party of the company's agents, who were adjusting their spirit level. After a little chat he left them, observing that by and by they would reach him again where he was going to measure. It was one of those grey mornings after light rains, which become delicious about twelve o'clock, when the clouds part a little, and the scent of the earth is sweet along the lanes and by the hedgerows. The scent would have been sweeter to Fred Vincey, who was coming along the lanes on horseback, if his mind had not been worried by unsuccessful efforts to imagine what he was to do, with his father on one side expecting him straightway to enter the church, with Mary on the other threatening to forsake him if he did enter it, and with the working-day world showing no eager need whatever of a young gentleman without capital and generally unskilled. 
It was the harder to Fred's disposition because his father, satisfied that he was no longer rebellious, was in good humor with him, and had sent him on this pleasant ride to see after some greyhounds. Even when he had fixed on what he should do, there would be the task of telling his father. But it must be admitted that the fixing, which had to come first, was the more difficult task, what secular avocation on earth was there for a young man, whose friends could not get him an appointment, which was at once gentlemanly, lucrative, and to be followed without special knowledge. Riding along the lanes by Frick in this mood, and slackening his pace while he reflected whether he should venture to go round by Lowick Parsonage to call on Mary, he could see over the hedges from one field to another. Suddenly a noise roused his attention, and on the far side of a field on his left hand he could see six or seven men in smockfrocks with hayforks in their hands making an offensive approach towards the four railway agents who were facing them, while Caleb Garth and his assistant were hastening across the field to join the threatened group. Fred, delayed a few moments by having to find the gate, could not gallop up to the spot before the party in smockfrocks, whose work of turning the hay had not been too pressing after swallowing their midday beer, were driving the men in coats before them with their hay forks, while Caleb Garth's assistant, a lad of seventeen, who had snatched up the spirit level at Caleb's order, had been knocked down and seemed to be lying helpless. The coated men had the advantage as runners, and Fred covered their retreat by getting in front of the smock frocks and charging them suddenly enough to throw their chase into confusion. What do you confounded fools mean, shouted Fred, pursuing the divided group in a zigzag, and cutting right and left with his whip. I'll swear to every one of you before the magistrate. You've knocked the lad down and killed him, for what I know. You'll every one of you be hanged at the next assizes, if you don't mind, said Fred, who afterwards laughed heartily as he remembered his own phrases. The laborers had been driven through the gateway into their hayfield, and Fred had checked his horse, when Hiram Ford, observing himself at a safe challenging distance, turned back and shouted a defiance which he did not know to be Homeric. You're a coward, you are. You get off your horse, young meester, and I'll have a round why ye, I wool. Yo daren't come on why out your hoss and whip. I'd soon knock the breath out on ye, I would. Wait a minute, and I'll come back presently, and have a round with you all in turn, if you like, said Fred, who felt confidence in his power of boxing with his dearly beloved brethren. But just now he wanted to hasten back to Caleb and the prostrate youth. The lad's ankle was strained, and he was in much pain from it, but he was no further hurt, and Fred placed him on the horse that he might ride to Yadril's and be taken care of there. Let them put the horse in the stable, and tell the surveyors they can come back for their traps, said Fred. The ground is clear now. No, no, said Caleb, here's a breakage. They'll have to give up for today, and it will be as well. Here, take the things before you on the horse, Tom. They'll see you coming, and they'll turn back. I'm glad I happened to be here at the right moment, Mr. Garth, said Fred, as Tom rode away. No knowing what might have happened if the cavalry had not come up in time. Aye, aye, it was lucky, said Caleb, speaking rather absently, and looking towards the spot where he had been at work at the moment of interruption. But, deuce take it, this is what comes of men being fools, I'm hindered of my day's work. I can't get along without somebody to help me with the measuring chain. However, he was beginning to move towards the spot with a look of vexation, as if he had forgotten Fred's presence, but suddenly he turned round and said quickly, What have you got to do today, young fellow? Nothing, Mr. Garth. I'll help you with pleasure, can I? said Fred, with a sense that he should be courting Mary when he was helping her father. Well, you mustn't mind stooping and getting hot. I don't mind anything. Only I want to go first and have a round with that hulky fellow who turned to challenge me. It would be a good lesson for him. I shall not be five minutes. Nonsense, said Caleb, with his most peremptory intonation. I shall go and speak to the men myself. It's all ignorance. Somebody has been telling them lies. The poor fools don't know any better. 
I shall go with you, then, said Fred. No, no, stay where you are. I don't want your young blood. I can take care of myself. Caleb was a powerful man and knew little of any fear except the fear of hurting others and the fear of having to speechify. But he felt it his duty at this moment to try and give a little harangue. There was a striking mixture in him, which came from his having always been a hard-working man himself, of rigorous notions about workmen and practical indulgence towards them. To do a good day's work and to do it well, he held to be part of their welfare, as it was the chief part of his own happiness, but he had a strong sense of fellowship with them. When he advanced towards the laborers they had not gone to work again, but were standing in that form of rural grouping which consists in each turning a shoulder towards the other, at a distance of two or three yards. They looked rather sulkily at Caleb, who walked quickly with one hand in his pocket and the other thrust between the buttons of his waistcoat, and had his everyday mild air when he paused among them. Why, my lads, how's this? he began, taking as usual to brief phrases, which seemed pregnant to himself, because he had many thoughts lying under them, like the abundant roots of a plant that just manages to peep above the water. How came you to make such a mistake as this? Somebody has been telling you lies. You thought those men up there wanted to do mischief. Ah, was the answer, dropped at intervals by each according to his degree of unreadiness. Nonsense. No such thing. They're looking out to see which way the railroad is to take. Now, my lads, you can't hinder the railroad, it will be made whether you like it or not. And if you go fighting against it, you'll get yourselves into trouble. The law gives those men leave to come here on the land. The owner has nothing to say against it, and if you meddle with them you'll have to do with the constable and Justice Blakesley, and with the handcuffs and Middlemarch jail. And you might be in for it now, if anybody informed against you. Caleb paused here, and perhaps the greatest orator could not have chosen either his pause or his images better for the occasion. But come, you didn't mean any harm. Somebody told you the railroad was a bad thing. That was a lie. It may do a bit of harm here and there, to this and to that, and so does the sun in heaven. But the railway's a good thing. Ah. Good for the big folks to make money out on, said old Timothy Cooper, who had stayed behind turning his hay while the others had been gone on their spree, I ain't seen lots o' oh, things turn up sin, I wore a young un, the Warren, the Peace, and the Connells, and the old King George, and the Regan, and the new King George, and the new un as has got a new any aim, and it's been all aloik to the poor mon. What's the Connells been tea him? They en brought him neither me at nor be a con, nor wage to lay by, if he didn't save it why, clem in his own inside. Times ha got wusser for him sin, I wore a young un. And so it'll be why, the railroads. They'll ony leave the poor mon further behind. But them are fools as metal, and so I told the chaps here. This is the big folks's world, this is. But yo re for the big folks, Muster Garth, yo are. Timothy was a wiry old laborer, of a type lingering in those times, who had his savings in a stocking foot, lived in a lone cottage, and was not to be wrought on by any oratory, having as little of the feudal spirit, and believing as little, as if he had not been totally unacquainted with the age of reason and the rights of man. Caleb was in a difficulty known to any person attempting in dark times and unassisted by miracle to reason with rustics who are in possession of an undeniable truth which they know through a hard process of feeling, and can let it fall like a giant's club on your neatly carved argument for a social benefit which they do not feel. Caleb had no cant at command, even if he could have chosen to use it, and he had been accustomed to meet all such difficulties in no other way than by doing his business faithfully. He answered, if you don't think well of me, Tim, never mind, that's neither here nor there now. Things may be bad for the poor man, bad they are, but I want the lads here not to do what will make things worse for themselves. The cattle may have a heavy load, but it won't help them to throw it over into the roadside pit, when it's partly their own fodder. We wore Ani for a bit o' oh, foon, said Hiram, who was beginning to see consequences.
that wore all we wore ardor. Well, promise me not to meddle again, and I'll see that nobody informs against you. Ian ne'er meddled, an Ian no call to promise, said Timothy. No, but the rest. Come, I'm as hard at work as any of you today, and I can't spare much time. Say you'll be quiet without the constable. Ah, we won't meddle, they may do as they loik for us, were the forms in which Caleb got his pledges, and then he hastened back to Fred, who had followed him, and watched him in the gateway. They went to work, and Fred helped vigorously. His spirits had risen, and he heartily enjoyed a good slip in the moist earth under the hedgerow, which soiled his perfect summer trousers. Was it his successful onset which had elated him, or the satisfaction of helping Mary's father? Something more. The accidents of the morning had helped his frustrated imagination to shape an employment for himself which had several attractions. I am not sure that certain fibers in Mr. Garth's mind had not resumed their old vibration towards the very end which now revealed itself to Fred. For the effective accident is but the touch of fire where there is oil and tow, and it always appeared to Fred that the railway brought the needed touch. But they went on in silence except when their business demanded speech. At last, when they had finished and were walking away, Mr. Garth said, A young fellow needn't be a b a to do this sort of work, Fred? I wish I had taken to it before I had thought of being a b said Fred. He paused a moment, and then added, more hesitatingly, Do you think I am too old to learn your business, Mr. Garth? My business is of many sorts, my boy, said Mr. Garth, smiling. A good deal of what I know can only come from experience, you can't learn it off as you learn things out of a book. But you are young enough to lay a foundation yet. Caleb pronounced the last sentence emphatically, but paused in some uncertainty. He had been under the impression lately that Fred had made up his mind to enter the church. You do think I could do some good at it, if I were to try, said Fred, more eagerly. That depends, said Caleb, turning his head on one side and lowering his voice, with the air of a man who felt himself to be saying something deeply religious. You must be sure of two things, you must love your work, and not be always looking over the edge of it, wanting your play to begin. And the other is, you must not be ashamed of your work, and think it would be more honorable to you to be doing something else. You must have a pride in your own work and in learning to do it well, and not be always saying, there's this and there's that, if I had this or that to do, I might make something of it. No matter what a man is, I wouldn't give tuppence for him, here Caleb's mouth looked bitter, and he snapped his fingers, whether he was the prime minister or the Rick Thatcher, if he didn't do well what he undertook to do. I can never feel that I should do that in being a clergyman, said Fred, meaning to take a step in argument. Then let it alone, my boy, said Caleb, abruptly, else you'll never be easy. Or, if you are easy, you'll be a poor stick. That is very nearly what Mary thinks about it, said Fred, coloring. I think you must know what I feel for Mary, Mr. Garth. I hope it does not displease you that I have always loved her better than anyone else, and that I shall never love anyone as I love her." The expression of Caleb's face was visibly softening while Fred spoke. But he swung his head with a solemn slowness, and said, that makes things more serious, Fred, if you want to take Mary's happiness into your keeping. I know that, Mr. Garth, said Fred, eagerly, and I would do anything for her. She says she will never have me if I go into the church, and I shall be the most miserable devil in the world if I lose all hope of Mary. Really, if I could get some other profession, business, anything that I am at all fit for, I would work hard, I would deserve your good opinion. I should like to have to do with outdoor things. I know a good deal about land and cattle already. I used to believe, you know, though you will think me rather foolish for it, that I should have land of my own. I am sure knowledge of that sort would come easily to me, especially if I could be under you in any way. Softly, my boy, said Caleb, having the image of Susan before his eyes. What have you said to your father about all this? Nothing, yet, but I must tell him. 
I am only waiting to know what I can do instead of entering the church. I am very sorry to disappoint him, but a man ought to be allowed to judge for himself when he is four and twenty. How could I know when I was fifteen, what it would be right for me to do now? My education was a mistake. But hearken to this, Fred, said Caleb. Are you sure Mary is fond of you, or whatever have you? I asked Mr. Fairbrother to talk to her, because she had forbidden me, I didn't know what else to do, said Fred, apologetically. And he says that I have every reason to hope, if I can put myself in an honorable position, I mean, out of the church. I dare say you think it unwarrantable in me, Mr. Garth, to be troubling you and obtruding my own wishes about Mary, before I have done anything at all for myself. Of course I have not the least claim, indeed, I have already a debt to you which will never be discharged, even when I have been able to pay it in the shape of money. Yes, my boy, you have a claim, said Caleb, with much feeling in his voice. The young ones have always a claim on the old to help them forward. I was young myself once and had to do without much help, but help would have been welcome to me, if it had been only for the fellow feeling's sake. But I must consider. Come to me tomorrow at the office, at nine o'clock. At the office, mind. Mr. Garth would take no important step without consulting Susan, but it must be confessed that before he reached home he had taken his resolution. With regard to a large number of matters about which other men are decided or obstinate, he was the most easily manageable man in the world. He never knew what meat he would choose, and if Susan had said that they ought to live in a four-roomed cottage, in order to save, he would have said, let us go, without inquiring into details. But where Caleb's feeling and judgment strongly pronounced, he was a ruler, and in spite of his mildness and timidity in reproving, Every one about him knew that on the exceptional occasions when he chose, he was absolute. He never, indeed, chose to be absolute except on someone else's behalf. On 99 points misses. Garth decided, but on the hundredth she was often aware that she would have to perform the singularly difficult task of carrying out her own principle, and to make herself subordinate. It has come round as I thought, Susan, said Caleb when they were seated alone in the evening. He had already narrated the adventure which had brought about Fred's sharing in his work, but had kept back the further result. The children are fond of each other, I mean, Fred and Mary. Mrs. Garth laid her work on her knee, and fixed her penetrating eyes anxiously on her husband. After we'd done our work, Fred poured it all out to me. He can't bear to be a clergyman, and Mary says she won't have him if he is one, and the lad would like to be under me and give his mind to business. And I've determined to take him and make a man of him. Caleb, said Mrs. Garth, in a deep contralto, expressive of resigned astonishment. It's a fine thing to do, said Mr. Garth, settling himself firmly against the back of his chair, and grasping the elbows. I shall have trouble with him, but I think I shall carry it through. The lad loves Mary, and a true love for a good woman is a great thing, Susan. It shapes many a rough fellow. Has Mary spoken to you on the subject, said Mrs. Garth, secretly a little hurt that she had to be informed on it herself. Not a word. I asked her about Fred once, I gave her a bit of a warning. But she assured me she would never marry an idle self-indulgent man, nothing since. But it seems Fred set on Mr. Fairbrother to talk to her, because she had forbidden him to speak himself, and Mr. Fairbrother has found out that she is fond of Fred, but says he must not be a clergyman. Fred's heart is fixed on Mary, that I can see, it gives me a good opinion of the lad, and we always liked him, Susan. It is a pity for Mary, I think, said Mrs. Garth. Why, a pity? Because, Caleb, she might have had a man who is worth twenty Fred Vincy's. Ah, said Caleb, with surprise. I firmly believe that Mr. Fairbrother is attached to her, and meant to make her an offer, but of course, now that Fred has used him as an envoy, there is an end to that better prospect. There was a severe precision in Mrs. Garth's utterance. She was vexed and disappointed, 
but she was bent on abstaining from useless words. Caleb was silent a few moments under a conflict of feelings. He looked at the floor and moved his head and hands in accompaniment to some inward argumentation. At last he said, that would have made me very proud and happy, Susan, and I should have been glad for your sake. I've always felt that your belongings have never been on a level with you. But you took me, though I was a plain man. I took the best and cleverest man I had ever known, said Mrs. Garth, convinced that she would never have loved anyone who came short of that mark. Well, perhaps others thought you might have done better. But it would have been worse for me. And that is what touches me close about Fred. The lad is good at bottom, and clever enough to do, if he's put in the right way, and he loves and honors my daughter beyond anything, and she has given him a sort of promise according to what he turns out. I say, that young man's soul is in my hand, and I'll do the best I can for him, so help me God. It's my duty, Susan. Mrs. Garth was not given to tears, but there was a large one rolling down her face before her husband had finished. It came from the pressure of various feelings, in which there was much affection and some vexation. She wiped it away quickly, saying, Few men besides you would think it a duty to add to their anxieties in that way, Caleb. That signifies nothing, what other men would think. I've got a clear feeling inside me, and that I shall follow, and I hope your heart will go with me, Susan, in making everything as light as can be to Mary, poor child. Caleb, leaning back in his chair, looked with anxious appeal towards his wife. She rose and kissed him, saying, God bless you, Caleb. Our children have a good father. But she went out and had a hearty cry to make up for the suppression of her words. She felt sure that her husband's conduct would be misunderstood, and about Fred she was rational and unhopeful. Which would turn out to have the more foresight in it, her rationality or Caleb's ardent generosity. When Fred went to the office the next morning, there was a test to be gone through which he was not prepared for. Now Fred, said Caleb, you will have some desk work. I have always done a good deal of writing myself, but I can't do without help, and as I want you to understand the accounts and get the values into your head, I mean to do without another clerk. So you must buckle to. How are you at writing and arithmetic? Fred felt an awkward movement of the heart, he had not thought of desk work, but he was in a resolute mood, and not going to shrink. I'm not afraid of arithmetic, Mr. Garth, it always came easily to me. I think you know my writing. Let us see, said Caleb, taking up a pen, examining it carefully and handing it, well dipped, to Fred with a sheet of ruled paper. Copy me a line or two of that valuation, with the figures at the end. At that time the opinion existed that it was beneath a gentleman to write legibly, or with a hand in the least suitable to a clerk. Fred wrote the lines demanded in a hand as gentlemanly as that of any viscount or bishop of the day, the vowels were all alike and the consonants only distinguishable as turning up or down, the strokes had a blotted solidity and the letters disdained to keep the line, in short, it was a manuscript of that venerable kind easy to interpret when you know beforehand what the writer means. As Caleb looked on, his visage showed a growing depression, but when Fred handed him the paper he gave something like a snarl, and wrapped the paper passionately with the back of his hand. Bad work like this dispelled all Caleb's mildness. The deuce, he exclaimed, snarlingly. To think that this is a country where a man's education may cost hundreds and hundreds, and it turns you out this. Then in a more pathetic tone, pushing up his spectacles and looking at the unfortunate scribe, the Lord have mercy on us, Fred, I can't put up with this. What can I do, Mr. Garth, said Fred, whose spirits had sunk very low, not only at the estimate of his handwriting, but at the vision of himself as liable to be ranked with office clerks. Do? Why, you must learn to form your letters and keep the line. What's the use of writing at all if nobody can understand it, asked Caleb, energetically, quite preoccupied with the bad quality of the work. Is there so little business in the world that you must be sending puzzles over the country? But that's the way people are brought up. 
I should lose no end of time with the letters some people send me, if Susan did not make them out for me. It's disgusting. Here Caleb tossed the paper from him. Any stranger peeping into the office at that moment might have wondered what was the drama between the indignant man of business and the fine-looking young fellow whose blonde complexion was getting rather patchy as he bit his lip with mortification. Fred was struggling with many thoughts. Mr. Garth had been so kind and encouraging at the beginning of their interview that gratitude and hopefulness had been at a high pitch, and the downfall was proportionate. He had not thought of desk work, in fact, like the majority of young gentlemen, he wanted an occupation which should be free from disagreeables. I cannot tell what might have been the consequences if he had not distinctly promised himself that he would go to Lawick to see Mary and tell her that he was engaged to work under her father. He did not like to disappoint himself there. I am very sorry, were all the words that he could muster. But Mr. Garth was already relenting. We must make the best of it, Fred, he began, with a return to his usual quiet tone. Every man can learn to write. I taught myself. Go at it with a will, and sit up at night if the daytime isn't enough. We'll be patient, my boy. Callum shall go on with the books for a bit, while you are learning. But now I must be off, said Caleb, rising. You must let your father know our agreement. You'll save me Callum's salary, you know, when you can write, and I can afford to give you eighty pounds for the first year, and more after. When Fred made the necessary disclosure to his parents, the relative effect on the two was a surprise which entered very deeply into his memory. He went straight from Mr. Garth's office to the warehouse, rightly feeling that the most respectful way in which he could behave to his father was to make the painful communication as gravely and formally as possible. Moreover, the decision would be more certainly understood to be final, if the interview took place in his father's gravest hours, which were always those spent in his private room at the warehouse. Fred entered on the subject directly, and declared briefly what he had done and was resolved to do, expressing at the end his regret that he should be the cause of disappointment to his father, and taking the blame on his own deficiencies. The regret was genuine and inspired Fred with strong, simple words. Mr. Vincey listened in profound surprise without uttering even an exclamation, a silence which in his impatient temperament was a sign of unusual emotion. He had not been in good spirits about trade that morning, and the slight bitterness in his lips grew intense as he listened. When Fred had ended, there was a pause of nearly a minute, during which Mr. Vincey replaced a book in his desk and turned the key emphatically. Then he looked at his son steadily, and said, So you've made up your mind at last, sir? Yes, father. Very well, stick to it. I've no more to say. You've thrown away your education, and gone down a step in life, when I had given you the means of rising, that's all. I am very sorry that we differ, father. I think I can be quite as much of a gentleman at the work I have undertaken, as if I had been a curate. But I am grateful to you for wishing to do the best for me. Very well, I have no more to say. I wash my hands of you. I only hope, when you have a son of your own he will make a better return for the pains you spend on him. This was very cutting to Fred. His father was using that unfair advantage possessed by us all when we are in a pathetic situation and see our own past as if it were simply part of the pathos. In reality, Mr. Vincey's wishes about his son had had a great deal of pride, inconsiderateness, and egoistic folly in them. But still the disappointed father held a strong lever, and Fred felt as if he were being banished with a malediction. I hope you will not object to my remaining at home, sir, he said, after rising to go, I shall have a sufficient salary to pay for my board, as of course I should wish to do. Board be hanged, said Mr. Vincey, recovering himself in his disgust at the notion that Fred's keep would be missed at his table. Of course your mother will want you to stay. But I shall keep no horse for you, you understand, and you will pay your own tailor. You will do with a suit or two less, I fancy, when you have to pay for them. Fred lingered, there was still something to be said. At last it came. 
I hope you will shake hands with me, father, and forgive me the vexation I have caused you. Mr. Vincey from his chair threw a quick glance upward at his son, who had advanced near to him, and then gave his hand, saying hurriedly, yes, yes, let us say no more. Fred went through much more narrative and explanation with his mother, but she was inconsolable, having before her eyes what perhaps her husband had never thought of, the certainty that Fred would marry Mary Garth, that her life would henceforth be spoiled by a perpetual infusion of Garth's and their ways, and that her darling boy, with his beautiful face and stylish air, beyond anybody else's son in Middlemarch, would be sure to get like that family in plainness of appearance and carelessness about his clothes. To her it seemed that there was a Garth conspiracy to get possession of the desirable Fred, but she dared not enlarge on this opinion, because a slight hint of it had made him fly out at her as he had never done before. Her temper was too sweet for her to show any anger, but she felt that her happiness had received a bruise, and for several days merely to look at Fred made her cry a little as if he were the subject of some baleful prophecy. Perhaps she was the slower to recover her usual cheerfulness because Fred had warned her that she must not reopen the sore question with his father, who had accepted his decision and forgiven him. If her husband had been vehement against Fred, she would have been urged into defense of her darling. It was the end of the fourth day when Mr. Vincey said to her, Come, Lucy, my dear, don't be so downhearted. You always have spoiled the boy, and you must go on spoiling him. Nothing ever did cut me so before, Vincey, said the wife, her fair throat and chin beginning to tremble again, only his illness. Pooh, pooh, never mind. We must expect to have trouble with our children. Don't make it worse by letting me see you out of spirits. Well, I won't, said Mrs. Vincey, roused by this appeal and adjusting herself with a little shake as of a bird which lays down its ruffled plumage. It won't do to begin making a fuss about one, said Mr. Vincey, wishing to combine a little grumbling with domestic cheerfulness. There's Rosamond as well as Fred. Yes, poor thing. I'm sure I felt for her being disappointed of her baby, but she got over it nicely. Baby, pooh. I can see Lydgate is making a mess of his practice, and getting into debt too, by what I hear. I shall have Rosamond coming to me with a pretty tale one of these days. But they'll get no money from me, I know. Let his family help him. I never did like that marriage. But it's no use talking. Ring the bell for lemons, and don't look dull any more, Lucy. I'll drive you and Louisa to Rivers Tun tomorrow. Chapter 57 They numbered scarce eight summers when a name rose on their souls and stirred such motions there as thrill the buds and shape their hidden frame at penetration of the quickening air, his name who told of loyal Evan D.H.U., of quaint Brad Radine, and Vich Ian Vore, making the little world their childhood knew large with a land of mountain lake and score, and larger yet with wonder, love, belief toward Walter Scott who living far away sent them this wealth of joy and noble grief. The book and they must part, but day by day, in lines that thwart like portly spiders ran they wrote the tale, from Tully Veolan. The evening that Fred Vincey walked to Lowick Parsonage, he had begun to see that this was a world in which even a spirited young man must sometimes walk for want of a horse to carry him, he set out at five o'clock and called on Mrs. Garth by the way, wishing to assure himself that she accepted their new relations willingly. He found the family group, dogs and cats included, under the great apple tree in the orchard. It was a festival with Mrs. Garth, for her eldest son, Christy, her peculiar joy and pride, had come home for a short holiday, Christy, who held it the most desirable thing in the world to be a tutor, to study all literatures and be a regenerate person, and who was an incorporate criticism on poor Fred, a sort of object lesson given to him by the educational mother. Christy himself, a square-browed, broad-shouldered masculine edition of his mother not much higher than Fred's shoulder, which made it the harder that he should be held superior, was always as simple as possible, and thought no more of Fred's disinclination to scholarship than of a giraffe's, wishing that he himself were more of the same height. He was lying on the ground now by his mother's chair, 
with his straw hat laid flat over his eyes, while Jim on the other side was reading aloud from that beloved writer who has made a chief part in the happiness of many young lives. The volume was Ivanhoe, and Jim was in the great archery scene at the tournament, but suffered much interruption from Ben, who had fetched his own old bow and arrows, and was making himself dreadfully disagreeable, Letty thought, by begging all present to observe his random shots, which no one wished to do except Brownie, the active-minded but probably shallow mongrel. While the grizzled Newfoundland lying in the sun looked on with the dull-eyed neutrality of extreme old age. Letty herself, showing as to her mouth and pinafore some slight signs that she had been assisting at the gathering of the cherries which stood in a coral heap on the tea table, was now seated on the grass, listening open-eyed to the reading. But the center of interest was changed for all by the arrival of Fred Vinci. When, seating himself on a garden stool, he said that he was on his way to Lowick Parsonage, Ben, who had thrown down his bow, and snatched up a reluctant half-grown kitten instead, strode across Fred's outstretched leg, and said, Take me. Oh, and me too, said Letty. You can't keep up with Fred and me, said Ben. Yes, I can. Mother, please say that I am to go, urged Letty whose life was much checkered by resistance to her depreciation as a girl. I shall stay with Christy, observed Jim, as much as to say that he had the advantage of those simpletons, whereupon Letty put her hand up to her head and looked with jealous indecision from the one to the other. Let us all go and see Mary, said Christy, opening his arms. No, my dear child, we must not go in a swarm to the parsonage. And that old Glasgow suit of yours would never do. Besides, your father will come home. We must let Fred go alone. He can tell Mary that you are here, and she will come back tomorrow. Christy glanced at his own threadbare knees, and then at Fred's beautiful white trousers. Certainly Fred's tailoring suggested the advantages of an English university, and he had a graceful way even of looking warm and of pushing his hair back with his handkerchief. Children, run away said Mrs. Garth, it is too warm to hang about your friends. Take your brother and show him the rabbits. The eldest understood, and led off the children immediately. Fred felt that Mrs. Garth wished to give him an opportunity of saying anything he had to say, but he could only begin by observing, how glad you must be to have Christy here. Yes, he has come sooner than I expected. He got down from the coach at nine o'clock, just after his father went out. I am longing for Caleb to come and hear what wonderful progress Christie is making. He has paid his expenses for the last year by giving lessons, carrying on hard study at the same time. He hopes soon to get a private tutorship and go abroad. He is a great fellow, said Fred, to whom these cheerful truths had a medicinal taste, and no trouble to anybody. After a slight pause, he added, but I fear you will think that I am going to be a great deal of trouble to Mr. Garth. Caleb likes taking trouble, he is one of those men who always do more than anyone would have thought of asking them to do, answered Mrs. Garth. She was knitting, and could either look at Fred or not, as she chose, always an advantage when one is bent on loading speech with salutary meaning, and though Mrs. Garth intended to be duly reserved, she did wish to say something that Fred might be the better for. I know you think me very undeserving, Mrs. Garth, and with good reason, said Fred, his spirit rising a little at the perception of something like a disposition to lecture him. I happen to have behaved just the worst to the people I can't help wishing for the most from. But while two men like Mr. Garth and Mr. Fairbrother have not given me up, I don't see why I should give myself up. Fred thought it might be well to suggest these masculine examples to Mrs. Garth. Assuredly, said she, with gathering emphasis. A young man for whom two such elders had devoted themselves would indeed be culpable if he threw himself away and made their sacrifices vain. Fred wondered a little at this strong language, but only said, I hope it will not be so with me, Mrs. Garth, since I have some encouragement to believe that I may win Mary. Mr. Garth has told you about that? You were not surprised, I dare say. Fred ended, innocently referring only to his own love as probably evident enough.
Not surprised that Mary has given you encouragement, returned Mrs. Garth, who thought it would be well for Fred to be more alive to the fact that Mary's friends could not possibly have wished this beforehand, whatever the Vincys might suppose. Yes, I confess I was surprised. She never did give me any, not the least in the world, when I talked to her myself, said Fred, eager to vindicate Mary. But when I asked Mr. Fairbrother to speak for me, she allowed him to tell me there was a hope. The power of admonition which had begun to stir in Mrs. Garth had not yet discharged itself. It was a little too provoking even for her self-control that this blooming youngster should flourish on the disappointments of sadder and wiser people, making a meal of a nightingale and never knowing it, and that all the while his family should suppose that hers was in eager need of this sprig, and her vexation had fermented the more actively because of its total repression towards her husband. Exemplary wives will sometimes find scapegoats in this way. She now said with energetic decision, you made a great mistake, Fred, in asking Mr. Fairbrother to speak for you. Did I? said Fred, reddening instantaneously. He was alarmed, but at a loss to know what Mrs. Garth meant, and added, in an apologetic tone, Mr. Fairbrother has always been such a friend of ours, and Mary, I knew, would listen to him gravely and he took it on himself quite readily. Yes, young people are usually blind to everything but their own wishes, and seldom imagine how much those wishes cost others, said Mrs. Garth. She did not mean to go beyond this salutary general doctrine, and threw her indignation into a needless unwinding of her worsted, knitting her brow at it with a grand air. I cannot conceive how it could be any pain to Mr. Fairbrother, said Fred, who nevertheless felt that surprising conceptions were beginning to form themselves. Precisely, you cannot conceive, said Mrs. Garth, cutting her words as neatly as possible. For a moment Fred looked at the horizon with a dismayed anxiety, and then turning with a quick movement said almost sharply, Do you mean to say, Mrs. Garth, that Mr. Fairbrother is in love with Mary? And if it were so, Fred, I think you are the last person who ought to be surprised, returned Mrs. Garth, laying her knitting down beside her and folding her arms. It was an unwanted sign of emotion in her that she should put her work out of her hands. In fact her feelings were divided between the satisfaction of giving Fred his discipline and the sense of having gone a little too far. Fred took his hat and stick and rose quickly. Then you think I am standing in his way, and in Mary's too, he said, in a tone which seemed to demand an answer. Mrs. Garth could not speak immediately. She had brought herself into the unpleasant position of being called on to say what she really felt, yet what she knew there were strong reasons for concealing. And to her the consciousness of having exceeded in words was peculiarly mortifying. Besides, Fred had given out unexpected electricity, and he now added, Mr. Garth seemed pleased that Mary should be attached to me. He could not have known anything of this. Mrs. Garth felt a severe twinge at this mention of her husband, the fear that Caleb might think her in the wrong not being easily endurable. She answered, wanting to check unintended consequences, I spoke from inference only. I am not aware that Mary knows anything of the matter. But she hesitated to beg that he would keep entire silence on a subject which she had herself unnecessarily mentioned, not being used to stoop in that way and while she was hesitating there was already a rush of unintended consequences under the apple tree where the tea things stood. Ben, bouncing across the grass with Brownie at his heels, and seeing the kitten dragging the knitting by a lengthening line of wool, shouted and clapped his hands, Brownie barked, the kitten, desperate, jumped on the tea table and upset the milk, then jumped down again and swept half the cherries with it, and Ben, snatching up the half-knitted sock top, fitted it over the kitten's head as a new source of madness. While Letty arriving cried out to her mother against this cruelty, it was a history. As full of sensation as, this is the house that Jack built. Mrs. Garth was obliged to interfere, the other young ones came up and the tete-a-tete -tete with Fred was ended. He got away as soon as he could, and Mrs. Garth could only imply some retractation of her severity by saying, God bless you, when she shook hands with him. 
She was unpleasantly conscious that she had been on the verge of speaking as one of the foolish women speaketh, telling first and entreating silence after. But she had not entreated silence, and to prevent Caleb's blame she determined to blame herself and confess all to him that very night. It was curious what an awful tribunal the mild Caleb's was to her, whenever he set it up. But she meant to point out to him that the revelation might do Fred Vinci a great deal of good. No doubt it was having a strong effect on him as he walked to Lawick. Fred's light hopeful nature had perhaps never had so much of a bruise as from this suggestion that if he had been out of the way Mary might have made a thoroughly good match. Also he was piqued that he had been what he called such a stupid lout as to ask that intervention from Mr. Fairbrother. But it was not in a lover's nature, it was not in Fred's, that the new anxiety raised about Mary's feeling should not surmount every other. Notwithstanding his trust in Mr. Fairbrother's generosity, notwithstanding what Mary had said to him, Fred could not help feeling that he had a rival, it was a new consciousness, and he objected to it extremely, not being in the least ready to give up Mary for her good, being ready rather to fight for her with any man whatsoever. But the fighting with Mr. Fairbrother must be of a metaphorical kind, which was much more difficult to Fred than the muscular. Certainly this experience was a discipline for Fred hardly less sharp than his disappointment about his uncle's will. The iron had not entered into his soul, but he had begun to imagine what the sharp edge would be. It did not once occur to Fred that Mrs. Garth might be mistaken about Mr. Fairbrother, but he suspected that she might be wrong about Mary. Mary had been staying at the parsonage lately, and her mother might know very little of what had been passing in her mind. He did not feel easier when he found her looking cheerful with the three ladies in the drawing room. They were in animated discussion on some subject which was dropped when he entered, and Mary was copying the labels from a heap of shallow cabinet drawers, in a minute handwriting which she was skilled in. Mr. Fairbrother was somewhere in the village, and the three ladies knew nothing of Fred's peculiar relation to Mary, it was impossible for either of them to propose that they should walk round the garden, and Fred predicted to himself that he should have to go away without saying a word to her in private. He told her first of Christie's arrival and then of his own engagement with her father, and he was comforted by seeing that this latter news touched her keenly. She said hurriedly, I am so glad, and then bent over her writing to hinder anyone from noticing her face. But here was a subject which Mrs. Fairbrother could not let pass. You don't mean, my dear Miss Garth, that you are glad to hear of a young man giving up the church for which he was educated, you only mean that things being so, you are glad that he should be under an excellent man like your father. No, really, Mrs. Fairbrother, I am glad of both, I fear, said Mary, cleverly getting rid of one rebellious tear. I have a dreadfully secular mind. I never liked any clergyman except the vicar of Wakefield and Mr. Fairbrother. Now why, my dear, said Mrs. Fairbrother, pausing on her large wooden knitting needles and looking at Mary. You have always a good reason for your opinions, but this astonishes me. Of course I put out of the question those who preach new doctrine. But why should you dislike clergymen? Oh dear, said Mary, her face breaking into merriment as she seemed to consider a moment, I don't like their neckcloths. Why, you don't like Camden's, then, said Miss Winifred, in some anxiety. Yes, I do, said Mary. I don't like the other clergymen's neckcloths, because it is they who wear them. How very puzzling, said Miss Noble, feeling that her own intellect was probably deficient. My dear, you are joking. You would have better reasons than these for slighting so respectable a class of men, said Mrs. Fairbrother, majestically. Miss Garth has such severe notions of what people should be that it is difficult to satisfy her, said Fred. Well, I am glad at least that she makes an exception in favor of my son, said the old lady. Mary was wondering at Fred's peaked tone, when Mr. Fairbrother came in and had to hear the news about the engagement under Mr. Garth. At the end he said with quiet satisfaction, that is right, and then bent to look at Mary's labels and praise her handwriting. Fred felt horribly jealous, was glad, of course, that Mr. Fairbrother was so estimable, 
but wished that he had been ugly and fat as men at forty sometimes are. It was clear what the end would be, since Mary openly placed Fairbrother above everybody, and these women were all evidently encouraging the affair. He was feeling sure that he should have no chance of speaking to Mary, when Mr. Fairbrother said, Fred, help me to carry these drawers back into my study, you have never seen my fine new study. Pray come too, Miss Garth. I want you to see a stupendous spider I found this morning. Mary at once saw the vicar's intention. He had never since the memorable evening deviated from his old pastoral kindness towards her, and her momentary wonder and doubt had quite gone to sleep. Mary was accustomed to think rather rigorously of what was probable, and if a belief flattered her vanity she felt warned to dismiss it as ridiculous, having early had much exercise in such dismissals. It was as she had foreseen, when Fred had been asked to admire the fittings of the study, and she had been asked to admire the spider, Mr. Fairbrother said, wait here a minute or two. I am going to look out an engraving which Fred is tall enough to hang for me. I shall be back in a few minutes. And then he went out. Nevertheless, the first word Fred said to Mary was, It is of no use, whatever I do, Mary. You are sure to marry fair brother at last. There was some rage in his tone. What do you mean, Fred? Mary exclaimed indignantly, blushing deeply, and surprised out of all her readiness in reply. It is impossible that you should not see it all clearly enough, you who see everything. I only see that you are behaving very ill, Fred, in speaking so of Mr. Fairbrother after he has pleaded your cause in every way. How can you have taken up such an idea? Fred was rather deep, in spite of his irritation. If Mary had really been unsuspicious, there was no good in telling her what Mrs. Garth had said. It follows as a matter of course, he replied. When you are continually seeing a man who beats me in everything, and whom you set up above everybody, I can have no fair chance. You are very ungrateful, Fred, said Mary. I wish I had never told Mr. Fairbrother that I cared for you in the least. No, I am not ungrateful, I should be the happiest fellow in the world if it were not for this. I told your father everything, and he was very kind, he treated me as if I were his son. I could go at the work with a will, writing, and everything, if it were not for this. For this? For what? said Mary, imagining now that something specific must have been said or done. This dreadful certainty that I shall be bowled out by fair brother. Mary was appeased by her inclination to laugh. Fred, she said, peeping round to catch his eyes, which were sulkily turned away from her, you are too delightfully ridiculous. If you were not such a charming simpleton, what a temptation this would be to play the wicked coquette, and let you suppose that somebody besides you has made love to me. Do you really like me best, Mary, said Fred, turning eyes full of affection on her, and trying to take her hand. I don't like you at all at this moment, said Mary, retreating, and putting her hands behind her. I only said that no mortal ever made love to me besides you. And that is no argument that a very wise man ever will, she ended, merrily. I wish you would tell me that you could not possibly ever think of him, said Fred. Never dare to mention this any more to me, Fred, said Mary, getting serious again. I don't know whether it is more stupid or ungenerous in you not to see that Mr. Fairbrother has left us together on purpose that we might speak freely. I am disappointed that you should be so blind to his delicate feeling. There was no time to say any more before Mr. Fairbrother came back with the engraving, and Fred had to return to the drawing room still with a jealous dread in his heart, but yet with comforting arguments from Mary's words and manner. The result of the conversation was on the whole more painful to Mary, inevitably her attention had taken a new attitude, and she saw the possibility of new interpretations. She was in a position in which she seemed to herself to be slighting Mr. Fairbrother, and this, in relation to a man who is much honored, is always dangerous to the firmness of a grateful woman. To have a reason for going home the next day was a relief, 
for Mary earnestly desired to be always clear that she loved Fred best. When a tender affection has been storing itself in us through many of our years, the idea that we could accept any exchange for it seems to be a cheapening of our lives. And we can set a watch over our affections and our constancy as we can over other treasures. Fred has lost all his other expectations, he must keep this, Mary said to herself, with a smile curling her lips. It was impossible to help fleeting visions of another kind, new dignities and an acknowledged value of which she had often felt the absence. But these things with Fred outside them, Fred forsaken and looking sad for the want of her, could never tempt her deliberate thought. Chapter 58 For there can live no hatred in thine eye, therefore in that I cannot know thy change, in many's looks the false heart's history is writ in moods and frowns and wrinkles strange, but heaven in thy creation did decree that in thy face sweet love should ever dwell, whatever thy thoughts or thy heart's workings be thy looks should nothing thence but sweetness tell. Shakespeare, Sonnets At the time when Mr. Vincy uttered that presentiment about Rosamond, she herself had never had the idea that she should be driven to make the sort of appeal which he foresaw. She had not yet had any anxiety about ways and means, although her domestic life had been expensive as well as eventful. Her baby had been born prematurely, and all the embroidered robes and caps had to be laid by in darkness. This misfortune was attributed entirely to her having persisted in going out on horseback one day when her husband had desired her not to do so, but it must not be supposed that she had shown temper on the occasion, or rudely told him that she would do as she liked. What led her particularly to desire horse exercise was a visit from Captain Lydgate, the baronet's third son, who, I am sorry to say, was detested by our Tertius of that name as a vapid fop, parting his hair from brow to nape in a despicable fashion, not followed by Tertius himself, and showing an ignorant security that he knew the proper thing to say on every topic. Lydgate inwardly cursed his own folly that he had drawn down this visit by consenting to go to his uncle's on the wedding tour and he made himself rather disagreeable to Rosamond by saying so in private. For to Rosamond this visit was a source of unprecedented but gracefully concealed exultation. She was so intensely conscious of having a cousin who was a baronet's son staying in the house, that she imagined the knowledge of what was implied by his presence to be diffused through all other minds, and when she introduced Captain Lydgate to her guests, she had a placid sense that his rank penetrated them as if it had been an odor. The satisfaction was enough for the time to melt away some disappointment in the conditions of marriage with a medical man even of good birth, it seemed now that her marriage was visibly as well as ideally floating her above the Middlemarch level, and the future looked bright with letters and visits to and from Qualingham, and vague advancement in consequence for Tertius. Especially as, probably at the captain's suggestion, his married sister, Mrs. Mengon, had come with her maid, and stayed two nights on her way from town. Hence it was clearly worth while for Rosamond to take pains with her music and the careful selection of her lace. As to Captain Lydgate himself, his low brow, his aquiline nose bent on one side, and his rather heavy utterance, might have been disadvantageous in any young gentleman who had not a military bearing and moustache to give him what is doted on by some flower-like blonde heads as style. He had, moreover, that sort of high breeding which consists in being free from the petty solicitudes of middle-class gentility, and he was a great critic of feminine charms. Rosamond delighted in his admiration now even more than she had done at Qualingham, and he found it easy to spend several hours of the day in flirting with her. The visit altogether was one of the pleasantest larks he had ever had, not the less so perhaps because he suspected that his queer cousin Tertius wished him away, though Lydgate, who would rather, hyperbolically speaking, have died than have failed in polite hospitality, suppressed his dislike, and only pretended generally not to hear what the gallant officer said, consigning the task of answering him to Rosamond. For he was not at all a jealous husband, and preferred leaving a feather-headed young gentleman alone with his wife to bearing him company. I wish you would talk more to the captain at dinner, Tertius, said Rosamond, one evening when the important guest was gone to Loamford to see some brother officers stationed there. You really look so absent sometimes, 
you seem to be seeing through his head into something behind it, instead of looking at him. My dear Rosie, you don't expect me to talk much to such a conceited ass as that, I hope, said Lydgate, brusquely. If he got his head broken, I might look at it with interest, not before. I cannot conceive why you should speak of your cousin so contemptuously, said Rosamond, her fingers moving at her work while she spoke with a mild gravity which had a touch of disdain in it. Ask Ladislaw if he doesn't think your captain the greatest bore he ever met with. Ladislaw has almost forsaken the house since he came. Rosamond thought she knew perfectly well why Mr. Ladislaw disliked the captain, he was jealous, and she liked his being jealous. It is impossible to say what will suit eccentric persons, she answered, but in my opinion Captain Lydgate is a thorough gentleman, and I think you ought not, out of respect to Sir Godwin, to treat him with neglect. No, dear, but we have had dinners for him. And he comes in and goes out as he likes. He doesn't want me. Still, when he is in the room, you might show him more attention. He may not be a phoenix of cleverness in your sense, his profession is different, but it would be all the better for you to talk a little on his subjects. I think his conversation is quite agreeable. And he is anything but an unprincipled man. The fact is, you would wish me to be a little more like him, Rosie, said Lydgate, in a sort of resigned murmur, with a smile which was not exactly tender, and certainly not merry. Rosamond was silent and did not smile again, but the lovely curves of her face looked good-tempered enough without smiling. Those words of Lydgate's were like a sad milestone marking how far he had traveled from his old dreamland, in which Rosamond Vincy appeared to be that perfect piece of womanhood who would reverence her husband's mind after the fashion of an accomplished mermaid, using her comb and looking-glass and singing her song for the relaxation of his adored wisdom alone. He had begun to distinguish between that imagined adoration and the attraction towards a man's talent because it gives him prestige, and is like an order in his buttonhole or an honorable before his name. It might have been supposed that Rosamond had traveled too, since she had found the pointless conversation of Mr. Ned Plymdale perfectly wearisome, but to most mortals there is a stupidity which is unendurable and a stupidity which is altogether acceptable, else, indeed, what would become of social bonds? Captain Lydgate's stupidity was delicately scented, carried itself with style, talked with a good accent, and was closely related to Sir Godwin. Rosamond found it quite agreeable and caught many of its phrases. Therefore since Rosamond, as we know, was fond of horseback, there were plenty of reasons why she should be tempted to resume her riding when Captain Lydgate, who had ordered his man with two horses to follow him and put up at the Green Dragon, begged her to go out on the grey which he warranted to be gentle and trained to carry a lady, indeed, he had bought it for his sister, and was taking it to Qualingham. Rosamond went out the first time without telling her husband, and came back before his return, but the ride had been so thorough a success, and she declared herself so much the better in consequence, that he was informed of it with full reliance on his consent that she should go riding again. On the contrary Lydgate was more than hurt, he was utterly confounded that she had risked herself on a strange horse without referring the matter to his wish. After the first almost thundering exclamations of astonishment, which sufficiently warned Rosamond of what was coming, he was silent for some moments. However, you have come back safely, he said, at last, in a decisive tone. You will not go again, Rosie, that is understood. If it were the quietest, most familiar horse in the world, there would always be the chance of accident. And you know very well that I wished you to give up riding the roan on that account. But there is the chance of accident indoors, Tertius. My darling, don't talk nonsense, said Lydgate, in an imploring tone, surely I am the person to judge for you. I think it is enough that I say you are not to go again. Rosamond was arranging her hair before dinner, and the reflection of her head in the glass showed no change in its loveliness except a little turning aside of the long neck. Lydgate had been moving about with his hands in his pockets, and now paused near her, as if he awaited some assurance. I wish you would fasten up my plates, dear, said Rosamond, letting her arms fall with a little sigh, so as to make a husband ashamed of standing there like a brute. 
Lydgate had often fastened the plates before, being among the deftest of men with his large finely formed fingers. He swept up the soft festoons of plates and fastened in the tall comb, to such use as do men come, and what could he do then but kiss the exquisite nape which was shown in all its delicate curves. But when we do what we have done before, it is often with a difference. Lydgate was still angry, and had not forgotten his point. I shall tell the captain that he ought to have known better than offer you his horse, he said, as he moved away. I beg you will not do anything of the kind, Tertius, said Rosamond, looking at him with something more marked than usual in her speech. It will be treating me as if I were a child. Promise that you will leave the subject to me. There did seem to be some truth in her objection. Lydgate said, very well, with a surly obedience, and thus the discussion ended with his promising Rosamond, and not with her promising him. In fact, she had been determined not to promise. Rosamond had that victorious obstinacy which never wastes its energy in impetuous resistance. What she liked to do was to her the right thing, and all her cleverness was directed to getting the means of doing it. She meant to go out riding again on the grey, and she did go on the next opportunity of her husband's absence, not intending that he should know until it was late enough not to signify to her. The temptation was certainly great, she was very fond of the exercise, and the gratification of riding on a fine horse, with Captain Lydgate, Sir Godwin's son, on another fine horse by her side, and of being met in this position by any one but her husband, was something as good as her dreams before marriage, moreover she was riveting the connection with the family at Qualingham, which must be a wise thing to do. But the gentle grey, unprepared for the crash of a tree that was being felled on the edge of Housel Wood, took fright, and caused a worse fright to Rosamond, leading finally to the loss of her baby. Lydgate could not show his anger towards her, but he was rather bearish to the captain, whose visit naturally soon came to an end. In all future conversations on the subject, Rosamond was mildly certain that the ride had made no difference, and that if she had stayed at home the same symptoms would have come on and would have ended in the same way, because she had felt something like them before. Lydgate could only say, poor, poor darling. But he secretly wondered over the terrible tenacity of this mild creature. There was gathering within him an amazed sense of his powerlessness over Rosamond. His superior knowledge and mental force, instead of being, as he had imagined, a shrine to consult on all occasions, was simply set aside on every practical question. He had regarded Rosamond's cleverness as precisely of the receptive kind which became a woman. He was now beginning to find out what that cleverness was, what was the shape into which it had run as into a close network aloof and independent. No one quicker than Rosamond to see causes and effects which lay within the track of her own tastes and interests, she had seen clearly Lydgate's preeminence in Middlemarch society, and could go on imaginatively tracing still more agreeable social effects when his talent should have advanced him, but for her. His professional and scientific ambition had no other relation to these desirable effects than if they had been the fortunate discovery of an ill-smelling oil. And that oil apart, with which she had nothing to do, of course she believed in her own opinion more than she did in his. Lydgate was astounded to find in numberless trifling matters, as well as in this last serious case of the writing, that affection did not make her compliant. He had no doubt that the affection was there and had no presentiment that he had done anything to repel it. For his own part he said to himself that he loved her as tenderly as ever, and could make up his mind to her negations, but, well. Lydgate was much worried, and conscious of new elements in his life as noxious to him as an inlet of mud to a creature that has been used to breathe and bathe and dart after its illuminated prey in the clearest of waters. Rosamond was soon looking lovelier than ever at her worktable, enjoying drives in her father's phaeton and thinking it likely that she might be invited to Qualingham. She knew that she was a much more exquisite ornament to the drawing-room there than any daughter of the family, and in reflecting that the gentlemen were aware of that, did not perhaps sufficiently consider whether the ladies would be eager to see themselves surpassed. Lydgate, relieved from anxiety about her, relapsed into what she inwardly called his moodiness, 
a name which to her covered his thoughtful preoccupation with other subjects than herself, as well as that uneasy look of the brow and distaste for all ordinary things as if they were mixed with bitter herbs, which really made a sort of weather glass to his vexation and foreboding. These latter states of mind had one cause amongst others, which he had generously but mistakenly avoided mentioning to Rosamond, lest it should affect her health and spirits. Between him and her indeed there was that total missing of each other's mental track, which is too evidently possible even between persons who are continually thinking of each other. To Lydgate it seemed that he had been spending month after month in sacrificing more than half of his best intent and best power to his tenderness for Rosamond, bearing her little claims and interruptions without impatience, and, above all, Bearing without betrayal of bitterness to look through less and less of interfering illusion at the blank unreflecting surface her mind presented to his ardor for the more impersonal ends of his profession and his scientific study, an ardor which he had fancied that the ideal wife must somehow worship as sublime, though not in the least knowing why. But his endurance was mingled with a self-discontent which, if we know how to be candid, we shall confess to make more than half our bitterness under grievances, wife or husband included. It always remains true that if we had been greater, circumstance would have been less strong against us. Lydgate was aware that his concessions to Rosamond were often little more than the lapse of slackening resolution, the creeping paralysis apt to seize an enthusiasm which is out of adjustment to a constant portion of our lives. And on Lydgate's enthusiasm there was constantly pressing not a simple weight of sorrow, but the biting presence of a petty degrading care, such as casts the blight of irony over all higher effort. This was the care which he had hitherto abstained from mentioning to Rosamond, and he believed, with some wonder, that it had never entered her mind, though certainly no difficulty could be less mysterious. It was an inference with a conspicuous handle to it, and had been easily drawn by indifferent observers, that Lydgate was in debt, and he could not succeed in keeping out of his mind for long together that he was every day getting deeper into that swamp which tempts men towards it with such a pretty covering of flowers and verdure. It is wonderful how soon a man gets up to his chin there, in a condition in which, in spite of himself, he is forced to think chiefly of release, though he had a scheme of the universe in his soul. Eighteen months ago Lydgate was poor, but had never known the eager want of small sums, and felt rather a burning contempt for any one who descended a step in order to gain them. He was now experiencing something worse than a simple deficit, he was assailed by the vulgar hateful trials of a man who has bought and used a great many things which might have been done without, and which he is unable to pay for, though the demand for payment has become pressing. How this came about may be easily seen without much arithmetic or knowledge of prices. When a man in setting up a house and preparing for marriage finds that his furniture and other initial expenses come to between four and five hundred pounds more than he has capital to pay for, when at the end of a year it appears that his household expenses, horses and et quiteras, amount to nearly a thousand, while the proceeds of the practice reckoned from the old books to be worth 800 per annum have sunk like a summer pond and make hardly 500, chiefly in unpaid entries. The plain inference is that, whether he minds it or not, he is in debt. Those were less expensive times than our own, and provincial life was comparatively modest, but the ease with which a medical man who had lately bought a practice, who thought that he was obliged to keep two horses, whose table was supplied without stint, and who paid an insurance on his life and a high rent for house and garden, might find his expenses doubling his receipts, can be conceived by anyone who does not think these details beneath his consideration. Rosamond, accustomed from her childhood to an extravagant household, thought that good housekeeping consisted simply in ordering the best of everything, nothing else answered, and Lydgate supposed that, if things were done at all, they must be done properly he did not see how they were to live otherwise. If each head of household expenditure had been mentioned to him beforehand, he would have probably observed that, it could hardly come to much, and if anyone had suggested a saving on a particular article, for example, the substitution of cheap fish for deer, it would have appeared to him simply a penny-wise, mean notion. Rosamond, even without such an occasion as Captain Lydgate's visit, was fond of giving invitations, and Lydgate, though he often thought the guests tiresome, did not interfere. 
This sociability seemed a necessary part of professional prudence, and the entertainment must be suitable. It is true Lydgate was constantly visiting the homes of the poor and adjusting his prescriptions of diet to their small means, but, dear me! Has it not by this time ceased to be remarkable, is it not rather that we expect in men, that they should have numerous strands of experience lying side by side and never compare them with each other? Expenditure, like ugliness and errors, becomes a totally new thing when we attach our own personality to it, and measure it by that wide difference which is manifest, in our own sensations, between ourselves and others. Lydgate believed himself to be careless about his dress, and he despised a man who calculated the effects of his costume, it seemed to him only a matter of course that he had abundance of fresh garments, such things were naturally ordered in sheaves. It must be remembered that he had never hitherto felt the check of importunate debt, and he walked by habit, not by self-criticism but the check had come. Its novelty made it the more irritating. He was amazed, disgusted that conditions so foreign to all his purposes, so hatefully disconnected with the objects he cared to occupy himself with, should have lain in ambush and clutched him when he was unaware. And there was not only the actual debt, there was the certainty that in his present position he must go on deepening it. Two furnishing tradesmen at Brassing, whose bills had been incurred before his marriage, and whom uncalculated current expenses had ever since prevented him from paying, had repeatedly sent him unpleasant letters which had forced themselves on his attention. This could hardly have been more galling to any disposition than to Lydgate's, with his intense pride, his dislike of asking a favor or being under an obligation to any one. He had scorned even to form conjectures about Mr. Vincey's intentions on money matters, and nothing but extremity could have induced him to apply to his father-in-law, even if he had not been made aware in various indirect ways since his marriage that Mr. Vincey's own affairs were not flourishing, and that the expectation of help from him would be resented. Some men easily trust in the readiness of friends, it had never in the former part of his life occurred to Lydgate that he should need to do so, he had never thought what borrowing would be to him, but now that the idea had entered his mind, he felt that he would rather incur any other hardship. In the meantime he had no money or prospects of money, and his practice was not getting more lucrative. No wonder that Lydgate had been unable to suppress all signs of inward trouble during the last few months, and now that Rosamond was regaining brilliant health, he meditated taking her entirely into confidence on his difficulties. New conversance with tradesmen's bills had forced his reasoning into a new channel of comparison, he had begun to consider from a new point of view what was necessary and unnecessary in goods ordered, and to see that there must be some change of habits. How could such a change be made without Rosamond's concurrence? The immediate occasion of opening the disagreeable fact to her was forced upon him. Having no money, and having privately sought advice as to what security could possibly be given by a man in his position, Lydgate had offered the one good security in his power to the less peremptory creditor, who was a silversmith and jeweler, and who consented to take on himself the upholsterer's credit also, accepting interest for a given term. The security necessary was a bill of sale on the furniture of his house, which might make a creditor easy for a reasonable time about a debt amounting to less than four hundred pounds, and the silversmith, Mr. Dover, was willing to reduce it by taking back a portion of the plate and any other article which was as good as new. Any other article was a phrase delicately implying jewellery, and more particularly some purple amethysts costing thirty pounds, which Lydgate had bought as a bridal present. Opinions may be divided as to his wisdom in making this present, some may think that it was a graceful attention to be expected from a man like Lydgate, and that the fault of any troublesome consequences lay in the pinched narrowness of provincial life at that time, which offered no conveniences for professional people whose fortune was not proportioned to their tastes, also, in Lydgate's ridiculous fastidiousness about asking his friends for money. However, it had seemed a question of no moment to him on that fine morning when he went to give a final order for plate, 
in the presence of other jewels enormously expensive, and as an addition to orders of which the amount had not been exactly calculated, thirty pounds for ornaments so exquisitely suited to Rosamond's neck and arms could hardly appear excessive when there was no ready cash for it to exceed. But at this crisis Lydgate's imagination could not help dwelling on the possibility of letting the amethysts take their place again among Mr. Dover's stock, though he shrank from the idea of proposing this to Rosamond. Having been roused to discern consequences which he had never been in the habit of tracing, he was preparing to act on this discernment with some of the rigor, by no means all, that he would have applied in pursuing experiment. He was nerving himself to this rigor as he rode from Brassing, and meditated on the representations he must make to Rosamond. It was evening when he got home. He was intensely miserable, this strong man of nine and twenty and of many gifts. He was not saying angrily within himself that he had made a profound mistake, but the mistake was at work in him like a recognized chronic disease, mingling its uneasy importunities with every prospect, and enfeebling every thought. As he went along the passage to the drawing room, he heard the piano and singing. Of course, Ladislaw was there. It was some weeks since Will had parted from Dorothea, yet he was still at the old post in Middlemarch. Lydgate had no objection in general to Ladislaw's coming, but just now he was annoyed that he could not find his hearth free. When he opened the door the two singers went on towards the keynote, raising their eyes and looking at him indeed, but not regarding his entrance as an interruption. To a man galled with his harness as poor Lydgate was, it is not soothing to see two people warbling at him, as he comes in with the sense that the painful day has still pains in store. His face, already paler than usual, took on a scowl as he walked across the room and flung himself into a chair. The singers feeling themselves excused by the fact that they had only three bars to sing, now turned round. How are you, Lydgate, said Will, coming forward to shake hands. Lydgate took his hand, but did not think it necessary to speak. Have you dined, Tertius? I expected you much earlier, said Rosamond, who had already seen that her husband was in a horrible humor. She seated herself in her usual place as she spoke. I have dined. I should like some tea, please, said Lydgate, curtly, still scowling and looking markedly at his legs stretched out before him. Will was too quick to need more. I shall be off, he said, reaching his hat. Tea is coming, said Rosamond, pray don't go. Yes, Lydgate is bored, said Will, who had more comprehension of Lydgate than Rosamond had, and was not offended by his manner, easily imagining outdoor causes of annoyance. There is the more need for you to stay, said Rosamond, playfully, and in her lightest accent, he will not speak to me all the evening. Yes, Rosamond, I shall, said Lydgate, in his strong baritone. I have some serious business to speak to you about. No introduction of the business could have been less like that which Lydgate had intended, but her indifferent manner had been too provoking. There. You see, said Will. I'm going to the meeting about the Mechanics Institute. Goodbye, and he went quickly out of the room. Rosamond did not look at her husband, but presently rose and took her place before the tea tray. She was thinking that she had never seen him so disagreeable. Lydgate turned his dark eyes on her and watched her as she delicately handled the tea service with her taper fingers, and looked at the objects immediately before her with no curve in her face disturbed, and yet with an ineffable protest in her air against all people with unpleasant manners. For the moment he lost the sense of his wound in a sudden speculation about this new form of feminine impassibility revealing itself in the sylph-like frame which he had once interpreted as the sign of a ready intelligent sensitiveness. His mind glancing back to Lore while he looked at Rosamond, he said inwardly, would she kill me because I wearied her, and then, it is the way with all women. But this power of generalizing which gives men so much the superiority in mistake over the dumb animals, was immediately thwarted by Lydgate's memory of wandering impressions from the behavior of another woman, from Dorothea's looks and tones of emotion about her husband when Lydgate began to attend him. 
from her passionate cry to be taught what would best comfort that man for whose sake it seemed as if she must quell every impulse in her except the yearnings of faithfulness and compassion. These revived impressions succeeded each other quickly and dreamily in Lydgate's mind while the tea was being brewed. He had shut his eyes in the last instant of reverie while he heard Dorothea saying, Advise me, think what I can do, he has been all his life laboring and looking forward. He minds about nothing else, and I mind about nothing else. That voice of deep-souled womanhood had remained within him as the enkindling conceptions of dead and sceptered genius had remained within him, is there not a genius for feeling nobly which also reigns over human spirits and their conclusions, the tones were a music from which he was falling away, he had really fallen into a momentary doze, when Rosamond said in her silvery neutral way, here is your tea, Tertius, setting it on the small table by his side, and then moved back to her place. Without looking at him. Lydgate was too hasty in attributing insensibility to her, after her own fashion, she was sensitive enough, and took lasting impressions. Her impression now was one of offense and repulsion. But then, Rosamond had no scowls and had never raised her voice, she was quite sure that no one could justly find fault with her. Perhaps Lydgate and she had never felt so far off each other before, but there were strong reasons for not deferring his revelation, even if he had not already begun it by that abrupt announcement, indeed some of the angry desire to rouse her into more sensibility on his account which had prompted him to speak prematurely, still mingled with his pain in the prospect of her pain. But he waited till the tray was gone, the candles were lit, and the evening quiet might be counted on, the interval had left time for repelled tenderness to return into the old course. He spoke kindly. Dear Rosie, lay down your work and come to sit by me, he said, gently, pushing away the table, and stretching out his arm to draw a chair near his own. Rosamond obeyed. As she came towards him in her drapery of transparent faintly tinted muslin, her slim yet round figure never looked more graceful, as she sat down by him and laid one hand on the elbow of his chair, at last looking at him and meeting his eyes, her delicate neck and cheek and purely cut lips never had more of that untarnished beauty which touches as in springtime and infancy and all sweet freshness. It touched Lydgate now, and mingled the early moments of his love for her with all the other memories which were stirred in this crisis of deep trouble. He laid his ample hand softly on hers, saying, Dear, with the lingering utterance which affection gives to the word. Rosamond too was still under the power of that same past, and her husband was still in part the Lydgate whose approval had stirred delight. She put his hair lightly away from his forehead, then laid her other hand on his, and was conscious of forgiving him. I am obliged to tell you what will hurt you, Rosie. But there are things which husband and wife must think of together. I dare say it has occurred to you already that I am short of money." Lydgate paused, but Rosamond turned her neck and looked at a vase on the mantelpiece. I was not able to pay for all the things we had to get before we were married, and there have been expenses since which I have been obliged to meet. The consequence is, there is a large debt at Brassing, 380 pounds, which has been pressing on me a good while, and in fact we are getting deeper every day, for people don't pay me the faster because others want the money. I took pains to keep it from you while you were not well, but now we must think together about it, and you must help me. What can I do, Tertius, said Rosamond, turning her eyes on him again. That little speech of four words, like so many others in all languages, is capable by varied vocal inflections of expressing all states of mind from helpless dimness to exhaustive argumentative perception, from the completest self-devoting fellowship to the most neutral aloofness. Rosamond's thin utterance threw into the words, what can, do, as much neutrality as they could hold. They fell like a mortal chill on Lydgate's roused tenderness. He did not storm in indignation, he felt too sad a sinking of the heart. And when he spoke again it was more in the tone of a man who forces himself to fulfill a task. It is necessary for you to know, because I have to give security for a time, and a man must come to make an inventory of the furniture. Rosamond colored deeply. Have you not asked Papa for money, she said, 
as soon as she could speak. No. Then I must ask him, she said, releasing her hands from Lydgate's, and rising to stand at two yards distance from him. No, Rosie, said Lydgate, decisively. It is too late to do that. The inventory will be begun tomorrow. Remember it is a mere security, it will make no difference, it is a temporary affair. I insist upon it that your father shall not know, unless I choose to tell him, added Lydgate, with a more peremptory emphasis. This certainly was unkind, but Rosamond had thrown him back on evil expectation as to what she would do in the way of quiet steady disobedience. The unkindness seemed unpardonable to her, she was not given to weeping and disliked it, but now her chin and lips began to tremble and the tears welled up. Perhaps it was not possible for Lydgate, under the double stress of outward material difficulty and of his own proud resistance to humiliating consequences, to imagine fully what this sudden trial was to a young creature who had known nothing but indulgence, and whose dreams had all been of new indulgence, more exactly to her taste. But he did wish to spare her as much as he could, and her tears cut him to the heart. He could not speak again immediately, but Rosamond did not go on sobbing, she tried to conquer her agitation and wiped away her tears, continuing to look before her at the mantelpiece. Try not to grieve, darling, said Lydgate, turning his eyes up towards her. That she had chosen to move away from him in this moment of her trouble made everything harder to say, but he must absolutely go on. We must brace ourselves to do what is necessary. It is I who have been in fault, I ought to have seen that I could not afford to live in this way. But many things have told against me in my practice, and it really just now has ebbed to a low point. I may recover it, but in the meantime we must pull up, we must change our way of living. We shall weather it. When I have given this security I shall have time to look about me, and you are so clever that if you turn your mind to managing you will school me into carefulness. I have been a thoughtless rascal about squaring prices, but come, dear, sit down and forgive me. Lydgate was bowing his neck under the yoke like a creature who had talons, but who had reason too, which often reduces us to meekness. When he had spoken the last words in an imploring tone, Rosamond returned to the chair by his side. His self-blame gave her some hope that he would attend to her opinion, and she said, why can you not put off having the inventory made? You can send the men away tomorrow when they come. I shall not send them away, said Lydgate, the peremptoriness rising again. Was it of any use to explain? If we left Middlemarch? There would of course be a sale, and that would do as well. But we are not going to leave Middlemarch. I am sure, Tertius, it would be much better to do so. Why can we not go to London? Or near Durham, where your family is known? We can go nowhere without money, Rosamond. Your friends would not wish you to be without money. And surely these odious tradesmen might be made to understand that, and to wait, if you would make proper representations to them. This is idle Rosamond, said Lydgate, angrily. You must learn to take my judgment on questions you don't understand. I have made necessary arrangements, and they must be carried out. As to friends, I have no expectations whatever from them, and shall not ask them for anything. Rosamond sat perfectly still. The thought in her mind was that if she had known how Lydgate would behave, she would never have married him. We have no time to waste now on unnecessary words, dear, said Lydgate, trying to be gentle again. There are some details that I want to consider with you. Dover says he will take a good deal of the plate back again, and any of the jewelry we like. He really behaves very well. Are we to go without spoons and forks then, said Rosamond, whose very lips seemed to get thinner with the thinness of her utterance. She was determined to make no further resistance or suggestions. Oh no, dear, said Lydgate. But look here, he continued, drawing a paper from his pocket and opening it, here is Dover's account. See, I have marked a number of articles, which if we returned them would reduce the amount by thirty pounds and more. I have not marked any of the jewellery. 
Lydgate had really felt this point of the jeweler very bitter to himself, but he had overcome the feeling by severe argument. He could not propose to Rosamond that she should return any particular present of his, but he had told himself that he was bound to put Dover's offer before her, and her inward prompting might make the affair easy. It is useless for me to look, Tertius, said Rosamond, calmly, you will return what you please. She would not turn her eyes on the paper, and Lydgate, flushing up to the roots of his hair, drew it back and let it fall on his knee. Meanwhile Rosamond quietly went out of the room, leaving Lydgate helpless and wondering. Was she not coming back? It seemed that she had no more identified herself with him than if they had been creatures of different species and opposing interests. He tossed his head and thrust his hands deep into his pockets with a sort of vengeance. There was still science, there were still good objects to work for. He must give a tug still, all the stronger because other satisfactions were going. But the door opened and Rosamond re-entered. She carried the leather box containing the amethysts, and a tiny ornamental basket which contained other boxes, and laying them on the chair where she had been sitting, she said, with perfect propriety in her air, this is all the jewelry you ever gave me. You can return what you like of it, and of the plate also. You will not, of course, expect me to stay at home tomorrow. I shall go to Papa's. To many women the look Lydgate cast at her would have been more terrible than one of anger, it had in it a despairing acceptance of the distance she was placing between them. And when shall you come back again, he said, with a bitter edge on his accent. Oh, in the evening. Of course I shall not mention the subject to Mama. Rosamond was convinced that no woman could behave more irreproachably than she was behaving, and she went to sit down at her work table. Lydgate sat meditating a minute or two, and the result was that he said, with some of the old emotion in his tone, Now we have been united, Rosie, you should not leave me to myself in the first trouble that has come. Certainly not, said Rosamond, I shall do everything it becomes me to do. It is not right that the thing should be left to servants, or that I should have to speak to them about it. And I shall be obliged to go out, I don't know how early. I understand your shrinking from the humiliation of these money affairs. But, my dear Rosamond, as a question of pride, which I feel just as much as you can, it is surely better to manage the thing ourselves, and let the servants see as little of it as possible, and since you are my wife, there is no hindering your share in my disgraces, if there were disgraces. Rosamond did not answer immediately, but at last she said, Very well, I will stay at home. I shall not touch these jewels, Rosie. Take them away again. But I will write out a list of plate that we may return, and that can be packed up and sent at once. The servants will know that, said Rosamond, with the slightest touch of sarcasm. Well, we must meet some disagreeables as necessities. Where is the ink, I wonder, said Lydgate, rising, and throwing the account on the larger table where he meant to write. Rosamond went to reach the inkstand, and after setting it on the table was going to turn away, when Lydgate, who was standing close by, put his arm round her and drew her towards him, saying, Come, darling, let us make the best of things. It will only be for a time, I hope, that we shall have to be stingy and particular. Kiss me. His native warm-heartedness took a great deal of quenching, and it is a part of manliness for a husband to feel keenly the fact that an inexperienced girl has got into trouble by marrying him. She received his kiss and returned it faintly, and in this way an appearance of accord was recovered for the time. But Lydgate could not help looking forward with dread to the inevitable future discussions about expenditure and the necessity for a complete change in their way of living. Chapter 59 they said of old the soul had human shape, but smaller, subtler than the fleshly self, so wandered forth for erring when it pleased. And see! Beside her cherub face there floats a pale-lipped form Ariel whispering its promptings in that little shell her ear. News is often dispersed as thoughtlessly and effectively as that pollen which the bees carry off, having no idea how powdery they are, when they are buzzing in search of their particular nectar. This fine comparison has reference to Fred Vinci, 
who on that evening at Lauk Parsonage heard a lively discussion among the ladies on the news which their old servant had got from Tantrip concerning Mr. Kasabin's strange mention of Mr. Ladislaw in a codicil to his will made not long before his death. Miss Winifred was astounded to find that her brother had known the fact before, and observed that Camden was the most wonderful man for knowing things and not telling them, whereupon Mary Garth said that the codicil had perhaps got mixed up with the habits of spiders, which Miss Winifred never would listen to. Mrs. Fairbrother considered that the news had something to do with their having only once seen Mr. Ladislaw at Lowick, and Miss Noble made many small compassionate mewings. Fred knew little and cared less about Ladislaw and the Kasabans, and his mind never recurred to that discussion till one day calling on Rosamond at his mother's request to deliver a message as he passed, he happened to see Ladislaw going away. Fred and Rosamond had little to say to each other now that marriage had removed her from collision with the unpleasantness of brothers, and especially now that he had taken what she held the stupid and even reprehensible step of giving up the church to take to such a business as Mr. Garth's. Hence Fred talked by preference of what he considered indifferent news, and, apropos of that young Ladislaw, mentioned what he had heard at Lowick Parsonage. Now Lydgate, like Mr. Fairbrother, knew a great deal more than he told, and when he had once been set thinking about the relation between Will and Dorothea his conjectures had gone beyond the fact. He imagined that there was a passionate attachment on both sides, and this struck him as much too serious to gossip about. He remembered Will's irritability when he had mentioned Mrs. Kasabin, and was the more circumspect. On the whole his surmises, in addition to what he knew of the fact, increased his friendliness and tolerance towards Ladislaw, and made him understand the vacillation which kept him at Middlemarch after he had said that he should go away. It was significant of the separateness between Lydgate's mind and Rosamond's that he had no impulse to speak to her on the subject, indeed, he did not quite trust her reticence towards Will. And he was right there, though he had no vision of the way in which her mind would act in urging her to speak. When she repeated Fred's news to Lydgate, he said, Take care you don't drop the faintest hint to Ladislaw, Rosie. He is likely to fly out as if you insulted him. Of course it is a painful affair. Rosamond turned her neck and patted her hair, looking the image of placid indifference. But the next time will came when Lydgate was away, she spoke archly about his not going to London as he had threatened. I know all about it. I have a confidential little bird, said she, showing very pretty airs of her head over the bit of work held high between her active fingers. There is a powerful magnet in this neighborhood. To be sure there is. Nobody knows that better than you, said Will, with light gallantry, but inwardly prepared to be angry. It is really the most charming romance, Mr. Kasabin jealous, and foreseeing that there was no one else whom Mrs. Kasabin would so much like to marry, and no one who would so much like to marry her as a certain gentleman, and then laying a plan to spoil all by making her forfeit her property if she did marry that gentleman, and then, and then, and then, oh, I have no doubt the end will be thoroughly romantic. Great God! What do you mean, said Will, flushing over face and ears, his features seeming to change as if he had had a violent shake. Don't joke, tell me what you mean. You don't really know, said Rosamond, no longer playful, and desiring nothing better than to tell in order that she might evoke effects. No, he returned, impatiently. Don't know that Mr. Kasabin has left it in his will that if Mrs. Kasabin marries you she is to forfeit all her property? How do you know that it is true? said Will, eagerly. My brother Fred heard it from the Fair Brothers. Will started up from his chair and reached his hat. I dare say she likes you better than the property, said Rosamond, looking at him from a distance. Pray don't say any more about it, said Will, in a hoarse undertone extremely unlike his usual light voice. It is a foul insult to her and to me. Then he sat down absently, looking before him, but seeing nothing. Now you are angry with me, said Rosamond. It is too bad to bear me malice. You ought to be obliged to me for telling you. So I am, said Will, abruptly, speaking with that kind of double soul which belongs to dreamers who answer questions. 
I expect to hear of the marriage, said Rosamond, playfully. Never. You will never hear of the marriage. With those words uttered impetuously, Will Rose, put out his hand to Rosamond, still with the air of a somnambulist, and went away. When he was gone, Rosamond left her chair and walked to the other end of the room, leaning when she got there against a chiffonier, and looking out of the window wearily. She was oppressed by ennui, and by that dissatisfaction which in women's minds is continually turning into a trivial jealousy, referring to no real claims, springing from no deeper passion than the vague exactingness of egoism, and yet capable of impelling action as well as speech. There really is nothing to care for much, said poor Rosamond inwardly, thinking of the family at Qualingham, who did not write to her, and that perhaps Tertius when he came home would tease her about expenses. She had already secretly disobeyed him by asking her father to help them, and he had ended decisively by saying, I am more likely to want help myself. Chapter 60 Good phrases are surely, and ever were, very commendable. Justice Shallow A few days afterwards, it was already the end of August, there was an occasion which caused some excitement in Middlemarch, the public, if it chose, was to have the advantage of buying, under the distinguished auspices of Mr. Borthrop Trumbull, the furniture, books, and pictures which anybody might see by the handbills to be the best in every kind, belonging to Edwin Larcher, E.S.Q. This was not one of the sales indicating the depression of trade, on the contrary, it was due to Mr. Larcher's great success in the carrying business, which warranted his purchase of a mansion near Rivers Tun already furnished in high style by an illustrious spa physician, furnished indeed with such large framefuls of expensive flesh painting in the dining room, that Mrs. Larcher was nervous until reassured by finding the subjects to be scriptural. Hence the fine opportunity to purchasers which was well pointed out in the handbills of Mr. Borthrop Trumbull, whose acquaintance with the history of art enabled him to state that the hall furniture, to be sold without reserve, comprised a piece of carving by a contemporary of Gibbons. At Middlemarch in those times a large sale was regarded as a kind of festival. There was a table spread with the best cold eatables, as at a superior funeral, and facilities were offered for that generous drinking of cheerful glasses which might lead to generous and cheerful bidding for undesirable articles. Mr. Larcher's sale was the more attractive in the fine weather because the house stood just at the end of the town, with a garden and stables attached, in that pleasant issue from Middlemarch called the London Road, which was also the road to the new hospital and to Mr. Bulstrode's retired residence, known as the Shrubs. In short, the auction was as good as a fair, and drew all classes with leisure at command, to some, who risked making bids in order simply to raise prices, it was almost equal to betting at the races. The second day, when the best furniture was to be sold, everybody was there, even Mr. Thesiger, the rector of St. Peter's, had looked in for a short time, wishing to buy the carved table, and had rubbed elbows with Mr. Bambridge and Mr. Horrock. There was a wreath of Middlemarch ladies accommodated with seats round the large table in the dining room, where Mr. Borthrop Trumbull was mounted with desk and hammer, but the rows chiefly of masculine faces behind were often varied by incomings and outgoings both from the door and the large bow window opening on to the lawn. Everybody that day did not include Mr. Bulstrode, whose health could not well endure crowds and drafts. But Mrs. Bulstrode had particularly wished to have a certain picture, supper at Emmaus, attributed in the catalogue to Guido, and at the last moment before the day of the sale Mr. Bulstrode had called at the office of the Pioneer, of which he was now one of the proprietors, to beg of Mr. Ladislaw as a great favour that he would obligingly use his remarkable knowledge of pictures on behalf of Mrs. Bulstrode, and judge of the value of this particular painting, if, added the scrupulously polite banker. Attendance at the sale would not interfere with the arrangements for your departure, which I know is imminent. This proviso might have sounded rather satirically in Will's ear if he had been in a mood to care about such satire. It referred to an understanding entered into many weeks before with the proprietors of the paper, that he should be at liberty any day he pleased to hand over the management to the sub-editor whom he had been training, since he wished finally to quit Middlemarch.
but indefinite visions of ambition are weak against the ease of doing what is habitual or beguilingly agreeable, and we all know the difficulty of carrying out a resolve when we secretly long that it may turn out to be unnecessary. In such states of mind the most incredulous person has a private leaning towards miracle, impossible to conceive how our wish could be fulfilled, still, very wonderful things have happened. Will did not confess this weakness to himself, but he lingered. What was the use of going to London at that time of the year? The rugby men who would remember him were not there, and so far as political writing was concerned, he would rather for a few weeks go on with the pioneer. At the present moment, however, when Mr. Bulstrode was speaking to him, he had both a strengthened resolve to go and an equally strong resolve not to go till he had once more seen Dorothea. Hence he replied that he had reasons for deferring his departure a little, and would be happy to go to the sale. Will was in a defiant mood, his consciousness being deeply stung with the thought that the people who looked at him probably knew a fact tantamount to an accusation against him as a fellow with low designs which were to be frustrated by a disposal of property. Like most people who assert their freedom with regard to conventional distinction, he was prepared to be sudden and quick at quarrel with anyone who might hint that he had personal reasons for that assertion, that there was anything in his blood, his bearing, or his character to which he gave the mask of an opinion. When he was under an irritating impression of this kind he would go about for days with a defiant look, the color changing in his transparent skin as if he were on the cavive, watching for something which he had to dart upon. This expression was peculiarly noticeable in him at the sale, and those who had only seen him in his moods of gentle oddity or of bright enjoyment would have been struck with a contrast. He was not sorry to have this occasion for appearing in public before the Middlemarch tribes of Toller, Hackbutt, and the rest, who looked down on him as an adventurer, and were in a state of brutal ignorance about Dante, who sneered at his Polish blood, and were themselves of a breed very much in need of crossing. He stood in a conspicuous place not far from the auctioneer, with a forefinger in each side pocket and his head thrown backward, not caring to speak to anybody, though he had been cordially welcomed as a connoisseur by Mr. Trumbull, who was enjoying the utmost activity of his great faculties. And surely among all men whose vocation requires them to exhibit their powers of speech, the happiest is a prosperous provincial auctioneer keenly alive to his own jokes and sensible of his encyclopedic knowledge. Some saturnine, sour-blooded persons might object to be constantly insisting on the merits of all articles from bootjacks to burghams, but Mr. Borthrop Trumbull had a kindly liquid in his veins, he was an admirer by nature, and would have liked to have the universe under his hammer, feeling that it would go at a higher figure for his recommendation. Meanwhile Mrs. Larcher's drawing-room furniture was enough for him. When Will Ladislaw had come in, a second fender, said to have been forgotten in its right place, suddenly claimed the auctioneer's enthusiasm, which he distributed on the equitable principle of praising those things most which were most in need of praise. The fender was of polished steel, with much lancet-shaped open work and a sharp edge. Now, ladies, said he, I shall appeal to you. Here is a fender which at any other sale would hardly be offered without reserve, being, as I may say, for quality of steel and quaintness of design, a kind of thing, here Mr. Trumbull dropped his voice and became slightly nasal, trimming his outlines with his left finger, that might not fall in with ordinary tastes. Allow me to tell you that by and by this style of workmanship will be the only one in vogue, half a crown, you said? Thank you, going at half a crown, this characteristic fender, and I have particular information that the antique style is very much sought after in high quarters. Three shillings, three and sixpence, hold it well up, Joseph. Look, ladies, at the chastity of the design, I have no doubt myself that it was turned out in the last century. Four shillings, Mr. Momsey, four shillings. It's not a thing I would put in my drawing room, said Mrs. Momsey, audibly, for the warning of the rash husband. I wonder at Mrs. Larcher. Every blessed child's head that fell against it would be cut in two. The edge is like a knife. Quite true, rejoined Mr. Trumbull, quickly, and most uncommonly useful to have a fender at hand that will cut, if you have a leather shoe tie or a bit of string that wants cutting and no knife at hand, 
many a man has been left hanging because there was no knife to cut him down. Gentlemen, here's a fender that if you had the misfortune to hang yourselves would cut you down in no time, with astonishing celerity, four and sixpence, five, five and sixpence, an appropriate thing for a spare bedroom where there was a four-poster and a guest a little out of his mind, six shillings, thank you, Mr. Clintup, going at six shillings, going, gone. The auctioneer's glance, which had been searching round him with a preternatural susceptibility to all signs of bidding, here dropped on the paper before him, and his voice too dropped into a tone of indifferent dispatch as he said, Mr. Clintup. Be handy, Joseph. It was worth six shillings to have a fender you could always tell that joke on, said Mr. Clintup, laughing low and apologetically to his next neighbor. He was a diffident though distinguished nurseryman, and feared that the audience might regard his bid as a foolish one. Meanwhile Joseph had brought a trayful of small articles. Now, ladies, said Mr. Trumbull, taking up one of the articles, this tray contains a very recherché lot, a collection of trifles for the drawing-room table, and trifles make the sum of human things, nothing more important than trifles, yes, Mr. Ladislaw, yes, by and by, but pass the tray round, Joseph, these bijoux must be examined, ladies. This I have in my hand is an ingenious contrivance, a sort of practical rebus, I may call it, here, you see, it looks like an elegant heart-shaped box, portable, for the pocket, there, again, it becomes like a splendid double flower, an ornament for the table, and now, Mr. Trumbull allowed the flower to fall alarmingly into strings of heart-shaped leaves, a book of riddles. No less than five hundred printed in a beautiful red. Gentlemen, if I had less of a conscience, should not wish you to bid high for this lot, I have a longing for it myself. What can promote innocent mirth, and I may say virtue, more than a good riddle, it hinders profane language, and attaches a man to the society of refined females. This ingenious article itself, without the elegant domino box, card basket, and C, ought alone to give a high price to the lot. Carried in the pocket it might make an individual welcome in any society. Four shillings, sir, four shillings for this remarkable collection of riddles with the E.T. Kiteras. Here is a sample, how must you spell honey to make it catch ladybirds? Answer, money. You hear, ladybirds, honey money. This is an amusement to sharpen the intellect, it has a sting, it has what we call satire, and wit without indecency. Four and sixpence, five shillings. The bidding ran on with warming rivalry. Mr. Bowyer was a bidder, and this was too exasperating. Bowyer couldn't afford it, and only wanted to hinder every other man from making a figure. The current carried even Mr. Horrock with it, but this committal of himself to an opinion fell from him with so little sacrifice of his neutral expression, that the bid might not have been detected as his but for the friendly oaths of Mr. Bambridge, who wanted to know what Horrock would do with blasted stuff only fit for haberdashers given over to that state of perdition which the horse-dealer so cordially recognized in the majority of earthly existences. The lot was finally knocked down at a guinea to Mr. Spilkins, young slender of the neighborhood, who was reckless with his pocket money and felt his want of memory for riddles. Come, Trumbull, this is too bad, you've been putting some old maid's rubbish into the sale, murmured Mr. Toller, getting close to the auctioneer. I want to see how the prints go, and I must be off soon. Immediately, Mr. Toller. It was only an act of benevolence which your noble heart would approve. Joseph. Quick with the prints, lot 235. Now, gentlemen, you who are connoisseurs, you are going to have a treat. Here is an engraving of the Duke of Wellington surrounded by his staff on the field of Waterloo, and notwithstanding recent events which have, as it were, enveloped our great hero in a cloud, I will be bold to say, for a man in my line must not be blown about by political winds, that a finer subject, of the modern order, belonging to our own time and epoch, the understanding of man could hardly conceive, angels might, perhaps, but not men, sirs, not men. Who painted it, 
said Mr. Powderell, much impressed. It is a proof before the letter, Mr. Powderell, the painter is not known, answered Trumbull, with a certain gaspingness in his last words, after which he pursed up his lips and stared round him. I'll bid a pound, said Mr. Powderell, in a tone of resolved emotion, as of a man ready to put himself in the breach. Whether from awe or pity, nobody raised the price on him. Next came two Dutch prints which Mr. Toller had been eager for, and after he had secured them he went away. Other prints, and afterward some paintings, were sold to leading middlemarchers who had come with a special desire for them, and there was a more active movement of the audience in and out, some, who had bought what they wanted, going away, others coming in either quite newly or from a temporary visit to the refreshments which were spread under the marquee on the lawn. It was this marquee that Mr. Bambridge was bent on buying, and he appeared to like looking inside it frequently, as a foretaste of its possession. On the last occasion of his return from it he was observed to bring with him a new companion, a stranger to Mr. Trumbull and every one else, whose appearance, however, led to the supposition that he might be a relative of the horse dealers, also given to indulgence. His large whiskers, imposing swagger, and swing of the leg, made him a striking figure, but his suit of black, rather shabby at the edges, caused the prejudicial inference that he was not able to afford himself as much indulgence as he liked. Who is it you've picked up, Bam? said Mr. Horrock, aside. Ask him yourself, returned Mr. Bambridge. He said he'd just turned in from the road. Mr. Horrock eyed the stranger, who was leaning back against his stick with one hand, using his toothpick with the other, and looking about him with a certain restlessness apparently under the silence imposed on him by circumstances. At length the supper at Emmaus was brought forward, to Will's immense relief, for he was getting so tired of the proceedings that he had drawn back a little and leaned his shoulder against the wall just behind the auctioneer. He now came forward again, and his eye caught the conspicuous stranger, who, rather to his surprise, was staring at him markedly. But Will was immediately appealed to by Mr. Trumbull. Yes, Mr. Ladislaw, yes, this interests you as a connoisseur, I think. It is some pleasure, the auctioneer went on with a rising fervor, to have a picture like this to show to a company of ladies and gentlemen, a picture worth any sum to an individual whose means were on a level with his judgment. It is a painting of the Italian school, by the celebrated Guido, the greatest painter in the world, the chief of the old masters, as they are called, I take it, because they were up to a thing or two beyond most of us, in possession of secrets now lost to the bulk of mankind. Let me tell you, gentlemen, I have seen a great many pictures by the old masters, and they are not all up to this mark, some of them are darker than you might like and not family subjects. But here is a guido, the frame alone is worth pounds, which any lady might be proud to hang up, a suitable thing for what we call a refectory in a charitable institution, if any gentleman of the corporation wished to show his munificence. Turn it a little, sir. Yes. Joseph, turn it a little towards Mr. Ladislaw, Mr. Ladislaw, having been abroad, understands the merit of these things, you observe. All eyes were for a moment turned towards Will, who said, coolly, five pounds. The auctioneer burst out in deep remonstrance. Ah! Mr. Ladislaw! The frame alone is worth that. Ladies and gentlemen, for the credit of the town. Suppose it should be discovered hereafter that a gem of art has been amongst us in this town, and nobody in Middlemarch awake to it. Five guineas, five seven six, five ten. Still, ladies, still. It is a gem, and, full many a gem, as the poet says, has been allowed to go at a nominal price because the public knew no better, because it was offered in circles where there was, I was going to say a low feeling, but no, six pounds, six guineas, a guido of the first order going at six guineas, it is an insult to religion, ladies, it touches us all as Christians, gentlemen, that a subject like this should go at such a low figure, six pounds ten, seven, the bidding was brisk, and will continue to share in it, remembering that Mrs. Bulstrode had a strong wish for the picture, 
and thinking that he might stretch the price to twelve pounds. But it was knocked down to him at ten guineas, whereupon he pushed his way towards the bow window and went out. He chose to go under the marquee to get a glass of water, being hot and thirsty, it was empty of other visitors, and he asked the woman in attendance to fetch him some fresh water, but before she was well gone he was annoyed to see entering the florid stranger who had stared at him. It struck well at this moment that the man might be one of those political parasitic insects of the bloated kind who had once or twice claimed acquaintance with him as having heard him speak on the reform question, and who might think of getting a shilling by news. In this light his person, already rather heating to behold on a summer's day, appeared the more disagreeable, and Will, half seated on the elbow of a garden chair, turned his eyes carefully away from the comber. But this signified little to our acquaintance Mr. Raffles, who never hesitated to thrust himself on unwilling observation, if it suited his purpose to do so. He moved a step or two till he was in front of Will, and said with full-mouthed haste, Excuse me, Mr. Ladislaw, was your mother's name Sarah Dunkirk? Will, starting to his feet, moved backward a step, frowning, and saying with some fierceness, Yes, sir, it was. And what is that to you? It was in Will's nature that the first spark it threw out was a direct answer of the question and a challenge of the consequences. To have said, What is that to you, in the first instance, would have seemed like shuffling, as if he minded who knew anything about his origin. Raffles on his side had not the same eagerness for a collision which was implied in Ladislaw's threatening air. The slim young fellow with his girl's complexion looked like a tiger cat ready to spring on him. Under such circumstances Mr. Raffles' pleasure in annoying his company was kept in abeyance. No offense, my good sir, no offense. I only remember your mother, knew her when she was a girl. But it is your father that you feature, sir. I had the pleasure of seeing your father too. Parents alive, Mr. Ladislaw. No, thundered Will, in the same attitude as before. Should be glad to do you a service, Mr. Ladislaw, by Jove, I should. Hope to meet again. Hereupon Raffles, who had lifted his hat with the last words, turned himself round with a swing of his leg and walked away. Will looked after him a moment, and could see that he did not re-enter the auction room, but appeared to be walking towards the road. For an instant he thought that he had been foolish not to let the man go on talking, but no. On the whole he preferred doing without knowledge from that source. Later in the evening, however, Raffles overtook him in the street, and appearing either to have forgotten the roughness of his former reception or to intend avenging it by a forgiving familiarity, greeted him jovially and walked by his side, remarking at first on the pleasantness of the town and neighborhood. Will suspected that the man had been drinking and was considering how to shake him off when Raffles said, I've been abroad myself, Mr. Ladislaw, I've seen the world, used to parley vous a little. It was at Boulogne I saw your father, a most uncommon likeness you are of him, by Jove. Mouth, nose, eyes, hair turned off your brow just like his, a little in the foreign style. John Bull doesn't do much of that. But your father was very ill when I saw him. Lord, Lord! Hands you might see through. You were a small youngster then. Did he get well? No, said Will, curtly. Ah. Well. I've often wondered what became of your mother. She ran away from her friends when she was a young lass, a proud-spirited lass, and pretty, by Jove. I knew the reason why she ran away, said Raffles, winking slowly as he looked sideways at Will. You know nothing dishonorable of her, sir, said Will turning on him rather savagely. But Mr. Raffles just now was not sensitive to shades of manner. Not a bit, said he, tossing his head decisively. She was a little too honorable to like her friends, that was it. Here Raffles again winked slowly. Lord bless you, I knew all about M, a little in what you may call the respectable thieving line, the high style of receiving house, none of your holes and corners, first rate. Slap up shop, high profits, and no mistake. But Lord! Sarah would have known nothing about it, 
a dashing young lady she was, fine boarding school, fit for a lord's wife, only Archie Duncan threw it at her out of spite, because she would have nothing to do with him. And so she ran away from the whole concern. I traveled for them, sir, in a gentlemanly way, at a high salary. They didn't mind her running away at first, godly folks, sir, very godly, and she was for the stage. The son was alive then, and the daughter was at a discount. Hello. Here we are at the Blue Bull. What do you say, Mr. Ladislaw, shall we turn in and have a glass? No, I must say good evening, said Will, dashing up a passage which led into Lowick Gate, and almost running to get out of Raffles' reach. He walked along while on the Lowick Road away from the town, glad of the starlit darkness when it came. He felt as if he had had dirt cast on him amidst shouts of scorn. There was this to confirm the fellow's statement, that his mother never would tell him the reason why she had run away from her family. Well. What was he, Will Ladislaw, the worse, supposing the truth about that family to be the ugliest? His mother had braved hardship in order to separate herself from it. But if Dorothea's friends had known this story, if the Chettams had known it, they would have had a fine color to give their suspicions a welcome ground for thinking him unfit to come near her. However, let them suspect what they pleased, they would find themselves in the wrong. They would find out that the blood in his veins was as free from the taint of meanness as theirs. Chapter 61 Inconsistencies, answered Imlac, cannot both be right, but imputed to man they may both be true. Rasselas. The same night, when Mr. Bolstrode returned from a journey to Brassing on business, his good wife met him in the entrance hall and drew him into his private sitting room. Nicholas, she said, fixing her honest eyes upon him anxiously, there has been such a disagreeable man here asking for you, it has made me quite uncomfortable. What kind of man, my dear, said Mr. Bolstrode, dreadfully certain of the answer. A red-faced man with large whiskers, and most impudent in his manner. He declared he was an old friend of yours, and said you would be sorry not to see him. He wanted to wait for you here, but I told him he could see you at the bank tomorrow morning. Most impudent he was, stared at me, and said his friend Nick had luck in wives. I don't believe he would have gone away, if Blucher had not happened to break his chain and come running round on the gravel, for I was in the garden, so I said, you'd better go away, the dog is very fierce, and I can't hold him. Do you really know anything of such a man? I believe I know who he is, my dear, said Mr. Bulstrode, in his usual subdued voice, an unfortunate dissolute wretch, whom I helped too much in days gone by. However, I presume you will not be troubled by him again. He will probably come to the bank, to beg, doubtless. No more was said on the subject until the next day, when Mr. Bulstrode had returned from the town and was dressing for dinner. His wife, not sure that he was come home, looked into his dressing room and saw him with his coat and cravat off, leaning one arm on a chest of drawers and staring absently at the ground. He started nervously and looked up as she entered. You look very ill, Nicholas. Is there anything the matter? I have a good deal of pain in my head, said Mr. Bulstrode, who was so frequently ailing that his wife was always ready to believe in this cause of depression. Sit down and let me sponge it with vinegar. Physically Mr. Bulstrode did not want the vinegar, but morally the affectionate attention soothed him. Though always polite, it was his habit to receive such services with marital coolness, as his wife's duty. But today, while she was bending over him, he said, You are very good, Harriet, in a tone which had something new in it to her ear, she did not know exactly what the novelty was, but her woman's solicitude shaped itself into a darting thought that he might be going to have an illness. Has anything worried you, she said. Did that man come to you at the bank? Yes, it was as I had supposed. He is a man who at one time might have done better. But he has sunk into a drunken debauched creature. Is he quite gone away? said Mrs. Bulstrode, anxiously, but for certain reasons she refrained from adding, 
it was very disagreeable to hear him calling himself a friend of yours. At that moment she would not have liked to say anything which implied her habitual consciousness that her husband's earlier connections were not quite on a level with her own. Not that she knew much about them. That her husband had at first been employed in a bank, that he had afterwards entered into what he called city business and gained a fortune before he was three and thirty, that he had married a widow who was much older than himself, a dissenter, and in other ways probably of that disadvantageous quality usually perceptible in a first wife if inquired into with the dispassionate judgment of a second, was almost as much as she had cared to learn beyond the glimpses which Mr. Bolstrode's narrative occasionally gave of his early bent towards religion, his inclination to be a preacher, and his association with missionary and philanthropic efforts. She believed in him as an excellent man whose piety carried a peculiar eminence in belonging to a layman, whose influence had turned her own mind towards seriousness, and whose share of perishable good had been the means of raising her own position. But she also liked to think that it was well in every sense for Mr. Bolstrode to have won the hand of Harriet Vincy, whose family was undeniable in a Middlemarch light, a better light surely than any thrown in London thoroughfares or dissenting chapel yards. The unreformed provincial mind distrusted London, and while true religion was everywhere saving, honest Mrs. Bolstrode was convinced that to be saved in the church was more respectable. She so so much wished to ignore towards others that her husband had ever been a London dissenter, that she liked to keep it out of sight even in talking to him. He was quite aware of this, indeed in some respects he was rather afraid of this ingenuous wife, whose imitative piety and native worldliness were equally sincere, who had nothing to be ashamed of, and whom he had married out of a thorough inclination still subsisting. But his fears were such as belong to a man who cares to maintain his recognized supremacy, the loss of high consideration from his wife, as from every one else who did not clearly hate him out of enmity to the truth, would be as the beginning of death to him. When she said, Is he quite gone away? Oh, I trust so, he answered, with an effort to throw as much sober unconcern into his tone as possible. But in truth Mr. Bolstrode was very far from a state of quiet trust. In the interview at the bank, Raffles had made it evident that his eagerness to torment was almost as strong in him as any other greed. He had frankly said that he had turned out of the way to come to Middlemarch, just to look about him and see whether the neighborhood would suit him to live in. He had certainly had a few debts to pay more than he expected, but the two hundred pounds were not gone yet, a cool five and twenty would suffice him to go away with for the present. What he had wanted chiefly was to see his friend Nick and family and know all about the prosperity of a man to whom he was so much attached. By and by he might come back for a longer stay. This time Raffles declined to be seen off the premises, as he expressed it, declined to quit Middlemarch under Bolstrode's eyes. He meant to go by coach the next day, if he chose. Bolstrode felt himself helpless. Neither threats nor coaxing could avail he could not count on any persistent fear nor on any promise. On the contrary, he felt a cold certainty at his heart that Raffles, unless Providence sent death to hinder him, would come back to Middlemarch before long. And that certainty was a terror. It was not that he was in danger of legal punishment or of beggary, he was in danger only of seeing disclosed to the judgment of his neighbors and the mournful perception of his wife certain facts of his past life which would render him an object of scorn and an opprobrium of the religion with which he had diligently associated himself. The terror of being judged sharpens the memory, it sends an inevitable glare over that long unvisited past which has been habitually recalled only in general phrases. Even without memory, the life is bound into one by a zone of dependence in growth and decay but intense memory forces a man to own his blameworthy past. With memory set smarting like a reopened wound, a man's past is not simply a dead history, an outworn preparation of the present, it is not a repented error shaken loose from the life, it is a still quivering part of himself, bringing shudders and bitter flavors and the tinglings of a merited shame. Into this second life Bulstrode's past had now risen, only the pleasures of it seeming to have lost their quality. Night and day, without interruption save of brief sleep which only wove retrospect and fear into a fantastic present, 
He felt the scenes of his earlier life coming between him and everything else, as obstinately as when we look through the window from a lighted room, the objects we turn our backs on are still before us, instead of the grass and the trees. The successive events inward and outward were there in one view, though each might be dwelt on in turn, the rest still kept their hold in the consciousness. Once more he saw himself the young banker's clerk, with an agreeable person, as clever in figures as he was fluent in speech and fond of theological definition, an eminent though young member of a Calvinistic dissenting church at Highbury, having had striking experience in conviction of sin and sense of pardon. Again he heard himself called for as Brother Bolstrode in prayer meetings, speaking on religious platforms, preaching in private houses. Again he felt himself thinking of the ministry as possibly his vocation, and inclined towards missionary labor. That was the happiest time of his life, that was the spot he would have chosen now to awake in and find the rest a dream. The people among whom Brother Bolstrode was distinguished were very few, but they were very near to him, and stirred his satisfaction the more, his power stretched through a narrow space, but he felt its effect the more intensely. He believed without effort in the peculiar work of grace within him, and in the signs that God intended him for special instrumentality. Then came the moment of transition, it was with the sense of promotion he had when he, an orphan educated at a commercial charity school, was invited to a fine villa belonging to Mr. Dunkirk, the richest man in the congregation. Soon he became an intimate there, honored for his piety by the wife, marked out for his ability by the husband, whose wealth was due to a flourishing city in West End trade. That was the setting in of a new current for his ambition, directing his prospects of instrumentality towards the uniting of distinguished religious gifts with successful business. By and by came a decided external leading, a confidential subordinate partner died, and nobody seemed to the principal so well fitted to fill the severely felt vacancy as his young friend Bolstrode, if he would become confidential accountant. The offer was accepted. The business was a pawnbroker's, of the most magnificent sort both in extent and profits, and on a short acquaintance with it Bolstrode became aware that one source of magnificent profit was the easy reception of any goods offered, without strict inquiry as to where they came from. But there was a branch house at the West End, and no pettiness or dinginess to give suggestions of shame. He remembered his first moments of shrinking. They were private, and were filled with arguments, some of these taking the form of prayer. The business was established and had old roots, is it not one thing to set up a new gin palace and another to accept an investment in an old one? The profits made out of lost souls, where can the line be drawn at which they begin in human transactions? Was it not even God's way of saving his chosen? Thou knowest, the young Bolstrode had said then, as the older Bolstrode was saying now, Thou knowest how loose my soul sits from these things, how I view them all as implements for tilling thy garden rescued here and there from the wilderness. Metaphors and precedents were not wanting, peculiar spiritual experiences were not wanting which at last made the retention of his position seem a service demanded of him, the vista of a fortune had already opened itself, and Bulstrode shrinking remained private. Mr. Dunkirk had never expected that there would be any shrinking at all, he had never conceived that trade had anything to do with the scheme of salvation. And it was true that Bulstrode found himself carrying on two distinct lives, his religious activity could not be incompatible with his business as soon as he had argued himself into not feeling it incompatible. Mentally surrounded with that past again, Bulstrode had the same pleas, Indeed, the years had been perpetually spinning them into intricate thickness, like masses of spider web, padding the moral sensibility, nay, as age made egoism more eager but less enjoying, his soul had become more saturated with the belief that he did everything for God's sake, being indifferent to it for his own. And yet, if he could be back in that far-off spot with his youthful poverty, why, then he would choose to be a missionary but the train of causes in which he had locked himself went on. There was trouble in the fine villa at Highbury. Years before, the only daughter had run away, defied her parents, and gone on the stage, and now the only boy died, and after a short time Mr. Dunkirk died also. 
The wife, a simple pious woman, left with all the wealth in and out of the magnificent trade, of which she never knew the precise nature, had come to believe in Bulstrode, and innocently adore him as women often adore their priest or man-made minister. It was natural that after a time marriage should have been thought of between them. But Mrs. Dunkirk had qualms and yearnings about her daughter, who had long been regarded as lost both to God and her parents. It was known that the daughter had married, but she was utterly gone out of sight. The, the mother, having lost her boy, imagined a grandson, and wished in a double sense to reclaim her daughter. If she were found, there would be a channel for property, perhaps a wide one, in the provision for several grandchildren. Efforts to find her must be made before Mrs. Dunkirk would marry again. Bulstrode concurred, but after advertisement as well as other modes of inquiry had been tried, the mother believed that her daughter was not to be found, and consented to marry without reservation of property. The daughter had been found, but only one man besides Bulstrode knew it, and he was paid for keeping silence and carrying himself away. That was the bare fact which Bulstrode was now forced to see in the rigid outline with which acts present themselves to onlookers. But for himself at that distant time, and even now in burning memory, the fact was broken into little sequences, each justified as it came by reasonings which seemed to prove it righteous. Bulstrode's course up to that time had, he thought, been sanctioned by remarkable providences, appearing to point the way for him to be the agent in making the best use of a large property and withdrawing it from perversion. Death and other striking dispositions, such as feminine trustfulness, had come, and Bulstrode would have adopted Cromwell's words, do you call these bare events? The Lord pity you. The events were comparatively small, but the essential condition was there, namely, that they were in favor of his own ends. It was easy for him to settle what was due from him to others by inquiring what were God's intentions with regard to himself. Could it be for God's service that this fortune should in any considerable proportion go to a young woman and her husband who were given up to the lightest pursuits, and might scatter it abroad in triviality, people who seemed to lie outside the path of remarkable providences? Bulstrode had never said to himself beforehand, the daughter shall not be found, nevertheless when the moment came he kept her existence hidden, and when other moments followed, he soothed the mother with consolation in the probability that the unhappy young woman might be no more. There were hours in which Bulstrode felt that his action was unrighteous, but how could he go back? He had mental exercises, called himself not, laid hold on redemption, and went on in his course of instrumentality. And after five years death again came to widen his path, by taking away his wife. He did gradually withdraw his capital, but he did not make the sacrifices requisite to put an end to the business, which was carried on for thirteen years afterwards before it finally collapsed. Meanwhile Nicholas Bulstrode had used his hundred thousand discreetly, and was become provincially, solidly important, a banker, a churchman, a public benefactor, also a sleeping partner in trading concerns, in which his ability was directed to economy in the raw material, as in the case of the dyes which rotted Mr. Vincey's silk. And now, when this respectability had lasted undisturbed for nearly thirty years, when all that preceded it had long lain benumbed in the consciousness, that past had risen and immersed his thought as if with the terrible eruption of a new sense overburthening the feeble being. Meanwhile, in his conversation with Raffles, he had learned something momentous, something which entered actively into the struggle of his longings and terrors. There, he thought, lay an opening towards spiritual, perhaps towards material rescue. The spiritual kind of rescue was a genuine need with him. There may be coarse hypocrites who consciously affect beliefs and emotions for the sake of gulling the world, but Bulstrode was not one of them. He was simply a man whose desires had been stronger than his theoretic beliefs, and who had gradually explained the gratification of his desires into satisfactory agreement with those beliefs. If this be hypocrisy, it is a process which shows itself occasionally in us all, to whatever confession we belong, and whether we believe in the future perfection of our race or in the nearest date fixed for the end of the world, whether we regard the earth as a putrefying nidus for a saved remnant, including ourselves, or have a passionate belief in the solidarity of mankind.
The service he could do to the cause of religion had been through life the ground he alleged to himself for his choice of action, it had been the motive which he had poured out in his prayers. Who would use money and position better than he meant to use them? Who could surpass him in self-abhorrence and exaltation of God's cause? And to Mr. Bolstrode God's cause was something distinct from his own rectitude of conduct, it enforced a discrimination of God's enemies, who were to be used merely as instruments, and whom it would be as well if possible to keep out of money and consequent influence. Also, profitable investments in trades where the power of the prince of this world showed its most active devices, became sanctified by a right application of the profits in the hands of God's servant. This implicit reasoning is essentially no more peculiar to evangelical belief than the use of wide phrases for narrow motives is peculiar to Englishmen. There is no general doctrine which is not capable of eating out our morality if unchecked by the deep-seated habit of direct fellow-feeling with individual fellow-men. But a man who believes in something else than his own greed, has necessarily a conscience or standard to which he more or less adapts himself. Bolstrode's standard had been his serviceableness to God's cause, I am sinful and not, a vessel to be consecrated by use, but use me had been the mold into which he had constrained his immense need of being something important and predominating. And now had come a moment in which that mold seemed in danger of being broken and utterly cast away. What if the acts he had reconciled himself to because they made him a stronger instrument of the divine glory, were to become the pretext of the scoffer, and a darkening of that glory? If this were to be the ruling of providence, he was cast out from the temple as one who had brought unclean offerings. He had long poured out utterances of repentance. But today a repentance had come which was of a bitterer flavor, and a threatening providence urged him to a kind of propitiation which was not simply a doctrinal transaction. The divine tribunal had changed its aspect for him, self prostration was no longer enough, and he must bring restitution in his hand. It was really before his God that Bulstrode was about to attempt such restitution as seemed possible a great dread had seized his susceptible frame, and the scorching approach of shame wrought in him a new spiritual need. Night and day, while the resurgent threatening past was making a conscience within him, he was thinking by what means he could recover peace and trust, by what sacrifice he could stay the rod. His belief in these moments of dread was, that if he spontaneously did something right, God would save him from the consequences of wrongdoing. For religion can only change when the emotions which fill it are changed, and the religion of personal fear remains nearly at the level of the savage. He had seen Raffles actually going away on the brassing coach, and this was a temporary relief, it removed the pressure of an immediate dread, but did not put an end to the spiritual conflict and the need to win protection. At last he came to a difficult resolve, and wrote a letter to Will Ladislaw, begging him to be at the shrubs that evening for a private interview at nine o'clock. Will had felt no particular surprise at the request, and connected it with some new notions about the pioneer, but when he was shown into Mr. Bulstrode's private room, he was struck with the painfully worn look on the banker's face, and was going to say, are you ill, when, checking himself in that abruptness, he only inquired after Mrs. Bulstrode, and her satisfaction with the picture bought for her. Thank you, she is quite satisfied, she has gone out with her daughters this evening. I begged you to come, Mr. Ladislaw, because I have a communication of a very private, indeed, I will say, of a sacredly confidential nature, which I desire to make to you. Nothing, I dare say, has been farther from your thoughts than that there had been important ties in the past which could connect your history with mine. Will felt something like an electric shock. He was already in a state of keen sensitiveness and hardly allayed agitation on the subject of ties in the past, and his presentiments were not agreeable. It seemed like the fluctuations of a dream, as if the action begun by that loud bloated stranger were being carried on by this pale-eyed sickly-looking piece of respectability, whose subdued tone and glib formality of speech were at this moment almost as repulsive to him as their remembered contrast. He answered, with a marked change of color, no, indeed, nothing. You see before you, Mr. Ladislaw, a man who is deeply stricken. But for the urgency of conscience and the knowledge that I am before the bar of one who seeth not as man seeth, 
I should be under no compulsion to make the disclosure which has been my object in asking you to come here tonight. So far as human laws go, you have no claim on me whatever. Will was even more uncomfortable than wondering. Mr. Bulstrode had paused, leaning his head on his hand, and looking at the floor. But he now fixed his examining glance on Will and said, I am told that your mother's name was Sarah Dunkirk, and that she ran away from her friends to go on the stage. Also, that your father was at one time much emaciated by illness. May I ask if you can confirm these statements? Yes, they are all true, said Will, struck with the order in which an inquiry had come, that might have been expected to be preliminary to the banker's previous hints. But Mr. Bulstrode had tonight followed the order of his emotions, he entertained no doubt that the opportunity for restitution had come, and he had an overpowering impulse towards the penitential expression by which he was deprecating chastisement. Do you know any particulars of your mother's family? he continued. No, she never liked to speak of them. She was a very generous, honorable woman, said Will, almost angrily. I do not wish to allege anything against her. Did she never mention her mother to you at all? I have heard her say that she thought her mother did not know the reason of her running away. She said, poor mother, in a pitying tone. That mother became my wife, said Bulstrode, and then paused a moment before he added, you have a claim on me, Mr. Ladislaw, as I said before, not a legal claim, but one which my conscience recognizes. I was enriched by that marriage, a result which would probably not have taken place, certainly not to the same extent, if your grandmother could have discovered her daughter. That daughter, I gather, is no longer living. No, said Will, feeling suspicion and repugnance rising so strongly within him, that without quite knowing what he did, he took his hat from the floor and stood up. The impulse within him was to reject the disclosed connection. Pray be seated, Mr. Ladislaw, said Bulstrode, anxiously. Doubtless you are startled by the suddenness of this discovery. But I entreat your patience with one who is already bowed down by inward trial. Will reseated himself, feeling some pity which was half contempt for this voluntary self-abasement of an elderly man. It is my wish, Mr. Ladislaw, to make amends for the deprivation which befell your mother. I know that you are without fortune, and I wish to supply you adequately from a store which would have probably already been yours had your grandmother been certain of your mother's existence and been able to find her. Mr. Bulstrode paused. He felt that he was performing a striking piece of scrupulosity in the judgment of his auditor, and a penitential act in the eyes of God. He had no clue to the state of Will Ladislaw's mind, smarting as it was from the clear hints of raffles, and with its natural quickness in construction stimulated by the expectation of discoveries which he would have been glad to conjure back into darkness. Will made no answer for several moments, till Mr. Bulstrode, who at the end of his speech had cast his eyes on the floor, now raised them with an examining glance, which Will met fully, saying, I suppose you did know of my mother's existence, and knew where she might have been found. Bulstrode shrank, there was a visible quivering in his face and hands. He was totally unprepared to have his advances met in this way, or to find himself urged into more revelation than he had beforehand set down as needful. But at that moment he dared not tell a lie, and he felt suddenly uncertain of his ground which he had trodden with some confidence before. I will not deny that you conjecture rightly, he answered, with a faltering in his tone. And I wish to make atonement to you as the one still remaining who has suffered a loss through me. You enter, I trust, into my purpose, Mr. Ladislaw, which has a reference to higher than merely human claims, and as I have already said, is entirely independent of any legal compulsion. I am ready to narrow my own resources and the prospects of my family by binding myself to allow you five hundred pounds yearly during my life, and to leave you a proportional capital at my death, nay, to do still more, if more should be definitely necessary to any laudable project on your part. Mr. Bulstrode had gone on to particulars in the expectation that these would work strongly on Ladislaw, and merge other feelings in grateful acceptance. But Will was looking as stubborn as possible, 
with his lip pouting and his fingers in his side pockets. He was not in the least touched, and said firmly, Before I make any reply to your proposition, Mr. Bolstrode, I must beg you to answer a question or two. Were you connected with the business by which that fortune you speak of was originally made? Mr. Bolstrode's thought was, Raffles has told him. How could he refuse to answer when he had volunteered what drew forth the question? He answered, yes. And was that business, or was it not, a thoroughly dishonorable one, nay, one that, if its nature had been made public, might have ranked those concerned in it with thieves and convicts? Will's tone had a cutting bitterness, he was moved to put his question as nakedly as he could. Bulstrode reddened with irrepressible anger. He had been prepared for a scene of self-abasement, but his intense pride and his habit of supremacy overpowered penitence, and even dread, when this young man, whom he had meant to benefit, turned on him with the air of a judge. The business was established before I became connected with it, sir, nor is it for you to institute an inquiry of that kind, he answered, not raising his voice, but speaking with quick defiantness. Yes, it is, said Will, starting up again with his hat in his hand. It is eminently mine to ask such questions, when I have to decide whether I will have transactions with you and accept your money. My unblemished honor is important to me. It is important to me to have no stain on my birth and connections. And now I find there is a stain which I can't help. My mother felt it, and tried to keep as clear of it as she could, and so will I. You shall keep your ill-gotten money. If I had any fortune of my own, I would willingly pay it to anyone who could disprove what you have told me. What I have to thank you for is that you kept the money till now, when I can refuse it. It ought to lie with a man's self that he is a gentleman. Good night, sir. Bolstrode was going to speak, but Will, with determined quickness, was out of the room in an instant, and in another the hall door had closed behind him. He was too strongly possessed with passionate rebellion against this inherited blot which had been thrust on his knowledge to reflect at present whether he had not been too hard on Bolstrode, too arrogantly merciless towards a man of sixty, who was making efforts at retrieval when time had rendered them vain. No third person listening could have thoroughly understood the impetuosity of Will's repulse or the bitterness of his words. No one but himself then knew how everything connected with the sentiment of his own dignity had an immediate bearing for him on his relation to Dorothea and to Mr. Kasabin's treatment of him. And in the rush of impulses by which he flung back that offer of Bulstrode's there was mingled the sense that it would have been impossible for him ever to tell Dorothea that he had accepted it. As for Bulstrode, when Will was gone he suffered a violent reaction, and wept like a woman. It was the first time he had encountered an open expression of scorn from any man higher than Raffles, and with that scorn hurrying like venom through his system, there was no sensibility left to consolations. But the relief of weeping had to be checked. His wife and daughters soon came home from hearing the address of an Oriental missionary, and were full of regret that Papa had not heard, in the first instance, the interesting things which they tried to repeat to him. Perhaps, through all other hidden thoughts, the one that breathed most comfort was, that Will Ladislaw at least was not likely to publish what had taken place that evening. Chapter 62 He was a squire of low degra, that loved the king's daughter of Hungary. Old Romance Will Ladislaw's mind was now wholly bent on seeing Dorothea again, and forthwith quitting Middlemarch. The morning after his agitating scene with Bulstrode he wrote a brief letter to her, saying that various causes had detained him in the neighborhood longer than he had expected, and asking her permission to call again at Lawick at some hour which she would mention on the earliest possible day, he being anxious to depart, but unwilling to do so until she had granted him an interview. He left the letter at the office, ordering the messenger to carry it to Lawick Manor, and wait for an answer. Ladislaw felt the awkwardness of asking for more last words. His former farewell had been made in the hearing of Sir James Chettam, and had been announced as final even to the butler. It is certainly trying to a man's dignity to reappear when he is not expected to do so, a first farewell has pathos in it, but to come back for a second lends an opening to comedy, 
and it was possible even that there might be bitter sneers afloat about Will's motives for lingering. Still it was on the whole more satisfactory to his feeling to take the directest means of seeing Dorothea, than to use any device which might give an air of chance to a meeting of which he wished her to understand that it was what he earnestly sought. When he had parted from her before, he had been in ignorance of facts which gave a new aspect to the relation between them, and made a more absolute severance than he had then believed in. He knew nothing of Dorothea's private fortune, and being little used to reflect on such matters, took it for granted that according to Mr. Kasabin's arrangement marriage to him, Will Ladislaw, would mean that she consented to be penniless. That was not what he could wish for even in his secret heart, or even if she had been ready to meet such hard contrast for his sake. And then, too, there was the fresh smart of that disclosure about his mother's family, which if known would be an added reason why Dorothea's friends should look down upon him as utterly below her. The secret hope that after some years he might come back with the sense that he had at least a personal value equal to her wealth, seemed now the dreamy continuation of a dream. This change would surely justify him in asking Dorothea to receive him once more. But Dorothea on that morning was not at home to receive Will's note. In consequence of a letter from her uncle announcing his intention to be at home in a week, she had driven first to Freshet to carry the news, meaning to go on to the Grange to deliver some orders with which her uncle had entrusted her, thinking, as he said, a little mental occupation of this sort good for a widow. If Will Ladislaw could have overheard some of the talk at Freshet that morning, he would have felt all his suppositions confirmed as to the readiness of certain people to sneer at his lingering in the neighborhood. Sir James, indeed, though much relieved concerning Dorothea, had been on the watch to learn Ladislaw's movements, and had an instructed informant in Mr. Standish, who was necessarily in his confidence on this matter. That Ladislaw had stayed in Middlemarch nearly two months after he had declared that he was going immediately, was a fact to embitter Sir James's suspicions, or at least to justify his aversion to a young fellow whom he represented to himself as slight, volatile, and likely enough to show such recklessness as naturally went along with a position unriveted by family ties or a strict profession. But he had just heard something from Standish which, while it justified these surmises about Will, offered a means of nullifying all danger with regard to Dorothea. Unwanted circumstances may make us all rather unlike ourselves, there are conditions under which the most majestic person is obliged to sneeze, and our emotions are liable to be acted on in the same incongruous manner. Good Sir James was this morning so far unlike himself that he was irritably anxious to say something to Dorothea on a subject which he usually avoided as if it had been a matter of shame to them both. He could not use Celia as a medium, because he did not choose that she should know the kind of gossip he had in his mind, and before Dorothea happened to arrive he had been trying to imagine how, with his shyness and unready tongue, he could ever manage to introduce his communication. Her unexpected presence brought him to utter hopelessness in his own power of saying anything unpleasant, but desperation suggested a resource, he sent the groom on an unsaddled horse across the park with a penciled note to Mrs. Cadwallader, who already knew the gossip, and would think it no compromise of herself to repeat it as often as required. Dorothea was detained on the good pretext that Mr. Garth, whom she wanted to see, was expected at the hall within the hour, and she was still talking to Caleb on the gravel when Sir James, on the watch for the rector's wife, saw her coming and met her with the needful hints. Enough. I understand, said Mrs. Cadwallader. You shall be innocent. I am such a blackamoor that I cannot smirch myself. I don't mean that it's of any consequence, said Sir James, disliking that Mrs. Cadwallader should understand too much. Only it is desirable that Dorothea should know there are reasons why she should not receive him again, and I really can't say so to her. It will come lightly from you. It came very lightly indeed. When Dorothea quitted Caleb and turned to meet them, it appeared that Mrs. Cadwallader had stepped across the park by the merest chance in the world, just to chat with Celia in a matronly way about the baby. And so Mr. Brooke was coming back. Delightful, coming back, it was to be hoped, quite cured of parliamentary fever and pioneering. 
Apropos of the pioneer, somebody had prophesied that it would soon be like a dying dolphin, and turn all colors for want of knowing how to help itself, because Mr. Brooks' protege, the brilliant young Ladislaw, was gone or going. Had Sir James heard that? The three were walking along the gravel slowly, and Sir James, turning aside to whip a shrub, said he had heard something of that sort. All false, said Mrs. Cadwallader. He is not gone, or going, apparently, the pioneer keeps its color, and Mr. Orlando Ladislaw is making a sad dark blue scandal by warbling continually with your Mr. Lydgate's wife, who they tell me is as pretty as pretty can be. It seems nobody ever goes into the house without finding this young gentleman lying on the rug or warbling at the piano. But the people in manufacturing towns are always disreputable. You began by saying that one report was false, Mrs. Cadwallader, and I believe this is false too, said Dorothea, with indignant energy, at least, I feel sure it is a misrepresentation. I will not hear any evil spoken of Mr. Ladislaw, he has already suffered too much injustice. Dorothea when thoroughly moved cared little what any one thought of her feelings, and even if she had been able to reflect, she would have held it petty to keep silence at injurious words about Will from fear of being herself misunderstood. Her face was flushed and her lip trembled. Sir James, glancing at her, repented of his stratagem, but Mrs. Cadwallader, equal to all occasions, spread the palms of her hands outward and said, Heaven grant it, my dear, I mean that all bad tales about anybody may be false. But it is a pity that young Lydgate should have married one of these Middlemarch girls. Considering he's a, a son of somebody, he might have got a woman with good blood in her veins, and not too young, who would have put up with his profession. There's Clara Harfager, for instance, whose friends don't know what to do with her, and she has a portion. Then we might have had her among us. However, it's no use being wise for other people. Where is Celia? Pray let us go in. I am going on immediately to Tipton, said Dorothea, rather haughtily. Goodbye. Sir James could say nothing as he accompanied her to the carriage. He was altogether discontented with the result of a contrivance which had cost him some secret humiliation beforehand. Dorothea drove along between the buried hedgerows and the shorn cornfields, not seeing or hearing anything around. The tears came and rolled down her cheeks, but she did not know it. The world, it seemed, was turning ugly and hateful, and there was no place for her trustfulness. It is not true, it is not true, was the voice within her that she listened to, but all the while a remembrance to which there had always clung a vague uneasiness would thrust itself on her attention, the remembrance of that day when she had found Will Ladislaw with Mrs. Lydgate, and had heard his voice accompanied by the piano. He said he would never do anything that I disapproved, I wish I could have told him that I disapproved of that, said poor Dorothea, inwardly, feeling a strange alternation between anger with Will and the passionate defense of him. They all try to blacken him before me, but I will care for no pain, if he is not to blame. I always believed he was good. These were her last thoughts before she felt that the carriage was passing under the archway of the lodge gate at the Grange, when she hurriedly pressed her handkerchief to her face and began to think of her errands. The coachman begged leave to take out the horses for half an hour as there was something wrong with a shoe, and Dorothea, having the sense that she was going to rest, took off her gloves and bonnet, while she was leaning against a statue in the entrance hall, and talking to the housekeeper. At last she said, I must stay here a little, Mrs. Kell. I will go into the library and write you some memoranda from my uncle's letter, if you will open the shutters for me. The shutters are open, madam, said Mrs. Kell, following Dorothea, who had walked along as she spoke. Mr. Ladislaw is there, looking for something. Will had come to fetch a portfolio of his own sketches which he had missed in the act of packing his movables, and did not choose to leave behind. Dorothea's heart seemed to turn over as if it had had a blow, but she was not perceptibly checked, in truth, the sense that Will was there was for the moment all satisfying to her, like the sight of something precious that one has lost. When she reached the door she said to Mrs. Kell, go in first, and tell him that I am here. 
Will had found his portfolio, and had laid it on the table at the far end of the room, to turn over the sketches and please himself by looking at the memorable piece of art which had a relation to nature too mysterious for Dorothea. He was smiling at it still, and shaking the sketches into order with the thought that he might find a letter from her awaiting him at Middlemarch, when Mrs. Kell close to his elbow said, Mrs. Kasabin is coming in, sir. Will turned round quickly, and the next moment Dorothea was entering. As Mrs. Kell closed the door behind her they met, each was looking at the other, and consciousness was overflowed by something that suppressed utterance. It was not confusion that kept them silent, for they both felt that parting was near, and there is no shamefacedness in a sad parting. She moved automatically towards her uncle's chair against the writing table, and Will, after drawing it out a little for her, went a few paces off and stood opposite to her. Pray sit down, said Dorothea, crossing her hands on her lap, I am very glad you were here. Will thought that her face looked just as it did when she first shook hands with him in Rome, for her widow's cap, fixed in her bonnet, had gone off with it, and he could see that she had lately been shedding tears. But the mixture of anger in her agitation had vanished at the sight of him, she had been used, when they were face to face, always to feel confidence and the happy freedom which comes with mutual understanding, and how could other people's words hinder that effect on a sudden? Let the music which can take possession of our frame and fill the air with joy for us, sound once more, what does it signify that we heard it found fault with in its absence? I have sent a letter to Lowick Manor today, asking leave to see you, said Will, seating himself opposite to her. I am going away immediately, and I could not go without speaking to you again. I thought we had parted when you came to Lowick many weeks ago, you thought you were going then, said Dorothea, her voice trembling a little. Yes, but I was in ignorance then of things which I know now, things which have altered my feelings about the future. When I saw you before, I was dreaming that I might come back some day. I don't think I ever shall, now. Will paused here. You wished me to know the reasons, said Dorothea, timidly. Yes, said Will, impetuously, shaking his head backward, and looking away from her with irritation in his face. Of course I must wish it. I have been grossly insulted in your eyes and in the eyes of others. There has been a mean implication against my character. I wish you to know that under no circumstances would I have lowered myself by, under no circumstances would I have given men the chance of saying that I sought money under the pretext of seeking, something else. There was no need of other safeguard against me, the safeguard of wealth was enough. Will rose from his chair with the last word and went, he hardly knew where, but it was to the projecting window nearest him, which had been open as now about the same season a year ago, when he and Dorothea had stood within it and talked together. Her whole heart was going out at this moment in sympathy with Will's indignation, she only wanted to convince him that she had never done him injustice, and he seemed to have turned away from her as if she too had been part of the unfriendly world. It would be very unkind of you to suppose that I ever attributed any meanness to you, she began. Then in her ardent way, wanting to plead with him, she moved from her chair and went in front of him to her old place in the window, saying, Do you suppose that I ever disbelieved in you? When Will saw her there, he gave a start and moved backward out of the window, without meeting her glance. Dorothea was hurt by this movement following up the previous anger of his tone. She was ready to say that it was as hard on her as on him, and that she was helpless, but those strange particulars of their relation which neither of them could explicitly mention kept her always in dread of saying too much. At this moment she had no belief that Will would in any case have wanted to marry her, and she feared using words which might imply such a belief. She only said earnestly, recurring to his last word, I am sure no safeguard was ever needed against you. Will did not answer. In the stormy fluctuation of his feelings these words of hers seemed to him cruelly neutral, and he looked pale and miserable after his angry outburst. He went to the table and fastened up his portfolio, while Dorothea looked at him from the distance. They were wasting these last moments together in wretched silence. What could he say, 
since what had got obstinately uppermost in his mind was the passionate love for her which he forbade himself to utter. What could she say, since she might offer him no help, since she was forced to keep the money that ought to have been his, since today he seemed not to respond as he used to do to her thorough trust and liking. But Will at last turned away from his portfolio and approached the window again. I must go, he said, with that peculiar look of the eyes which sometimes accompanies bitter feeling, as if they had been tired and burned with gazing too close at a light. What shall you do in life, said Dorothea, timidly. Have your intentions remained just the same as when we said goodbye before? Yes, said Will, in a tone that seemed to wave the subject as uninteresting. I shall work away at the first thing that offers. I suppose one gets a habit of doing without happiness or hope. Oh, what sad words, said Dorothea, with a dangerous tendency to sob. Then trying to smile, she added, we used to agree that we were alike in speaking too strongly. I have not spoken too strongly now, said Will, leaning back against the angle of the wall. There are certain things which a man can only go through once in his life, and he must know some time or other that the best is over with him. This experience has happened to me while I am very young, that is all. What I care more for than I can ever care for anything else is absolutely forbidden to me, I don't mean merely by being out of my reach, but forbidden me, even if it were within my reach, by my own pride and honor, by everything I respect myself for. Of course I shall go on living as a man might do who had seen heaven in a trance. Will paused, imagining that it would be impossible for Dorothea to misunderstand this, indeed he felt that he was contradicting himself and offending against his self-approval in speaking to her so plainly, but still, it could not be fairly called wooing a woman to tell her that he would never woo her. It must be admitted to be a ghostly kind of wooing. But Dorothea's mind was rapidly going over the past with quite another vision than his. The thought that she herself might be what Will most cared for did throb through her an instant, but then came doubt, the memory of the little they had lived through together turned pale and shrank before the memory which suggested how much fuller might have been the intercourse between Will and someone else with whom he had had constant companionship. Everything he had said might refer to that other relation, and whatever had passed between him and herself was thoroughly explained by what she had always regarded as their simple friendship and the cruel obstruction thrust upon it by her husband's injurious act. Dorothea stood silent, with her eyes cast down dreamily, while images crowded upon her which left the sickening certainty that Will was referring to Mrs. Lydgate. But why sickening? He wanted her to know that here too his conduct should be above suspicion. Will was not surprised at her silence. His mind also was tumultuously busy while he watched her, and he was feeling rather wildly that something must happen to hinder their parting, some miracle, clearly nothing in their own deliberate speech. Yet, after all, had she any love for him, he could not pretend to himself that he would rather believe her to be without that pain. He could not deny that a secret longing for the assurance that she loved him was at the root of all his words. Neither of them knew how long they stood in that way. Dorothea was raising her eyes, and was about to speak, when the door opened and her footman came to say, the horses are ready, madam, whenever you like to start. Presently, said Dorothea. Then turning to Will, she said, I have some memoranda to write for the housekeeper. I must go, said Will, when the door had closed again, advancing towards her. The day after tomorrow I shall leave Middlemarch. You have acted in every way rightly, said Dorothea, in a low tone, feeling a pressure at her heart which made it difficult to speak. She put out her hand, and Will took it for an instant without speaking, for her words had seemed to him cruelly cold and unlike herself. Their eyes met, but there was discontent in his, and in hers there was only sadness. He turned away and took his portfolio under his arm. I have never done you injustice. Please remember me, said Dorothea, repressing a rising sob. Why should you say that, said Will, with irritation as if I were not in danger of forgetting everything else. He had really a movement of anger against her at that moment, and it impelled him to go away without pause. 
It was all one flash to Dorothea, his last words, his distant bow to her as he reached the door, the sense that he was no longer there. She sank into the chair, and for a few moments sat like a statue, while images and emotions were hurrying upon her. Joy came first, in spite of the threatening train behind it, joy in the impression that it was really herself whom Will loved and was renouncing, that there was really no other love less permissible, more blameworthy, which honor was hurrying him away from. They were parted all the same, but, Dorothea drew a deep breath and felt her strength return, she could think of him unrestrainedly. At that moment the parting was easy to bear, the first sense of loving and being loved excluded sorrow. It was as if some hard icy pressure had melted, and her consciousness had room to expand, her past was come back to her with larger interpretation. The joy was not the less, perhaps it was the more complete just then, because of the irrevocable parting, for there was no reproach, no contemptuous wonder to imagine in any eye or from any lips. He had acted so as to defy reproach, and make wonder respectful. Anyone watching her might have seen that there was a fortifying thought within her. Just as when inventive power is working with glad ease some small claim on the attention is fully met as if it were only a cranny open to the sunlight, it was easy now for Dorothea to write her memoranda. She spoke her last words to the housekeeper in cheerful tones, and when she seated herself in the carriage her eyes were bright and her cheeks blooming under the dismal bonnet. She threw back the heavy weepers, and looked before her, wondering which road Will had taken. It was in her nature to be proud that he was blameless, and through all her feelings there ran this vein, I was right to defend him. The coachman was used to drive his greys at a good pace, Mr. Kasabin being unenjoying and impatient in everything away from his desk, and wanting to get to the end of all journeys, and Dorothea was now bowled along quickly. Driving was pleasant, for rain in the night had laid the dust, and the blue sky looked far off, away from the region of the great clouds that sailed in masses. The earth looked like a happy place under the vast heavens, and Dorothea was wishing that she might overtake Will and see him once more. After a turn of the road, there he was with the portfolio under his arm, but the next moment she was passing him while he raised his hat, and she felt a pang at being seated there in a sort of exaltation, leaving him behind. She could not look back at him. It was as if a crowd of indifferent objects had thrust them asunder, and forced them along different paths, taking them farther and farther away from each other, and making it useless to look back. She could no more make any sign that would seem to say, need we part, than she could stop the carriage to wait for him. Nay, what a world of reasons crowded upon her against any movement of her thought towards a future that might reverse the decision of this day. I only wish I had known before, I wish he knew, then we could be quite happy in thinking of each other, though we are forever parted. And if I could but have given him the money, and made things easier for him were the longings that came back the most persistently. And yet, so heavily did the world weigh on her in spite of her independent energy, that with this idea of will as in need of such help and at a disadvantage with the world, there came always the vision of that unfittingness of any closer relation between them which lay in the opinion of every one connected with her. She felt to the full all the imperativeness of the motives which urged Will's conduct. How could he dream of her defying the barrier that her husband had placed between them, how could she ever say to herself that she would defy it? Will's certainty as the carriage grew smaller in the distance, had much more bitterness in it. Very slight matters were enough to gall him in his sensitive mood, and the sight of Dorothea driving past him while he felt himself plodding along as a poor devil seeking a position in a world which in his present temper offered him little that he coveted, made his conduct seem a mere matter of necessity and took away the sustainment of resolve. After all, he had no assurance that she loved him, could any man pretend that he was simply glad in such a case to have the suffering all on his own side? That evening Will spent with the Lydgates, the next evening he was gone. 